Professor Aslan, who is going to be moderating this session. Um, this afternoon's uh, roundtable uh, is focusing particularly on, on financing sustainable public health system. Just for those of you who may not know, the, uh, the program itself oh. is actually part of a post-15 conference agenda. We had organized a bigger event towards um, the end of February, and uh, we didn't want the discussion to end. So we also put forward a plan to add a post conference agenda for the end of February. Uh, this will be a part of the the conference itself. We did not have the opportunity to listen to anyone speaking about health. Um, and so we thought this would be a good uh, occasion to talk about it, especially because. The theme of the conference um, is, uh, was to have an agenda for a sustainable, humane economy. And of course, I think we all agree that health is, is definitely one of the main areas of, of this sustainable, humane economy. Okay. And so, um, uh, the second round table today is talking about um, financing this sustainable public health system. Um, we wanted the first session to include a uh, presentation from the Ministry of Health of the, um, the health white paper. Uh, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, we were not able to get uh, you know, somebody to come from the Ministry of Health to present the, the health white paper. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take maybe five to eight minutes, giving you an extract extract of the, you know, the white paper, uh, and then we uh, ask our uh, two speakers to give their views on the topic. Okay. So, um, anyway, where is my, uh, my, this would be, this would be what the job was. So what, yeah, okay, so, so uh, before I, uh, uh, I, I know there is a Ministry of Health rep right here, is there anybody from Ministry of Health? I was told that there would be somebody. Although not speaking, but... Uh, okay, maybe not. Yeah, so, so, uh, you can speak for years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, um, uh, let me just spend uh, a few minutes. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, right? but I'm assuming that many of you would know, and probably know much more than me, about the health white paper that was presented uh, in 2023. Yeah, so, uh, health white paper for Malaysia, strengthening people's health, future proofing the nation's health system. So, um, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, 90-page document, or 120-page document. Oh, sorry, it's about 90 pages, I think. And, um, and uh, it has this in the table of contents. Let me just very quickly go straight to some of the things. One of the aspirations, the health white paper is talking about a healthy nation, emphasis towards preventive and promotional services so that all walks of life will adopt a healthier lifestyle. It's talking about an equitable, accessible, person-centered, quality, affordable health service system. Uh, the white paper talks about uh, creating a resilient health system, uh, able to anticipate uh, known health challenges, um, I think non-communicatable, uh, non communicatable diseases as well as rapid health emergencies. I think we'll be talking about uh, just coming out of COVID. Um, an open and innovative health ecosystem, incorporating technological advances and latest innovation. And then a health system prized and valued by the people. So uh, 
you know, very, very lofty uh, aspirations. Um, a shift from sick care to preventive and promotional services. Uh, Person-centered health system, anticipate, adapt, respond, open and innovative, and then valued by the people. Um, now, what is interesting about the paper is that it's talking about reforming the Ministry of Health. And this reform would gradually remove the Ministry of Health roles, both as health service provider. So the, the health service provider will go to what they call autonomous uh, agencies or, or, or parties. And also to uh, remove its role as purchaser of you know, medicines and equipment, etc., which will go to a strategic purchaser entity. All right? And Ministry of Health will just retain its regulator and policy maker role. Right? Um, and they want to do this um, within the first phase, which is five years. So these are things that, that uh, would be coming soon. The four key pillars of the health system reform, and this is the main part of the uh, white paper, the discussion of the four pillars. So pillar one, transforming health care service delivery. Uh, I think the key, the key uh, mode is effective public-private partnerships, and I'm sure you really have something to say about this. Uh, pillar two is advancing health promotion and disease prevention by moving away from treating ill people to, I think, the preventive uh, dimension. Pillar three is about ensuring the population receives comprehensive services uh, that are affordable. So looking at how you're going to finance this. Uh, so there's a discussion about revising current fee structure um, with payments to commensurate ability to pay, as well as developing uh, benefits a package that could be accessed by the population in both public and private sectors. And pillar four, uh, strengthening health service foundation and governance by restructuring the ministry's role and developing a national research strategy. Right, so these are the four pillars and, and they go into details if you read the white paper on each one of these pillars, um, you know, many, many um, uh, subheadings and details. Uh, now, coming to our round table, for all of those things that were put forward in the white paper, uh, more resources will be needed, um, especially in the case of the white paper, to prioritize primary health care services, right? So transformation will need to be cost effective and efficient while achieving wider quality services. The goal is to have less crowded facilities, shorter waiting periods, and bringing these services closer to the people. And of course, new approaches, including the use of AI technologies to improve the overall efficacy of the system to achieve um, the relevant SDGs. On the topic of financing public health, uh, at least the white paper that is there doesn't really go into details. So what we know is they want to move towards increased public funding, 5% of GDP. I'm assuming by the end of the, the is it the 15 year or the five year, I was not too clear about that. Um, to better target healthcare subsidies, What's that? Was it? to better target healthcare subsidies, the current fee structure, I think we mentioned that earlier, uh, payments to commensurate ability to pay, to diversify social funding options for a progressive contributory scheme will also be explored to ensure sustainability of health financing. And then the benefit package will be financed by a dedicated health fund under the management of a not-for-profit strategic purchaser. So I think we mentioned that earlier. And this uh, not-for-profit strategic purchaser will be governed by clear reporting standards, robust regulatory oversight. Uh, it will allow greater pooling of health and financial risks within the population. And this will contribute towards reduction in out-of-pocket spending. 
So maybe two things that we could think about is the role of this strategic purchaser, which was highlighted a few times in the, in the report, and then the scaling up of digitalization. I think in the morning we talked about this as a very important feature of the new economy, or the future economy, the use of AI and how it's going to uh, impact all our lives. And then uh, among the challenges is funding. All right. So uh, in addition to the main areas of the health uh, reforms, there was mention of education and training. And this would also require funding. Um, existing health-related policies, legislation, regulations will be improved. Uh, this requires political will and getting through those uh, changes. Uh, stimulating research, innovation, evidence-based approaches would be something else. I'm wondering whether one area of the research funds that were announced at the end of the morning session, maybe health research is one of those that uh, those of you interested can apply for. And finally, it includes investments in skilled workforce, infrastructure, and technology to increase research and innovation. All of this requires money. All right, so that's what we are here for this afternoon. Uh, and I just should mention one more thing. I was also informed that the Ministry of Health is actually still, um, you know, although the white paper has been presented and passed in Parliament, but apparently there's still a bit of discussion and modifications going on. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that whatever we discuss here, we'll, we'll be able to be, you know, make a contribution to the, to the paper. All right, I think that's it for me uh, in, in this kind of representing uh, the Ministry of Health to present this extract. I hope I've done uh, a fair uh, job in that. Our two speakers for the first morning session, or first afternoon session, uh, on my immediate left, uh, Professor Valitus Kajomo uh, Kwame Syndrome. Uh, he's currently a research advisor at KRI, but I think we all know him. Uh, he's had a long, um, illustrious career at the University of Malaya. Uh, I should say here, uh, he was my supervisor at the master's uh, degree. So, in a way, he introduced me also to my approach in dealing with Islamic economics, and that is to look at spectrum of thought rather than than just one view. Uh, he then uh, went to the United Nations and uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Rome, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he's been back and he was in ISIS, uh, sorry, again, Inst International uh, Institute for Strategic and International Studies in Malaysia, um, and been with Khazana Research Institute, I think, for, for a few years now. And I should also just add one more. He was, he has been visiting professor and adjunct professor with us in IIUM. Yeah. Um, our second speaker will be Mr. Azrul Muhammad Khalid, <coughs> founder and chief executive officer of Gallet Health Center for Health and Social Policy. Uh, for those of you who read uh, social media, he's very active. I think he's been commenting a lot on, on uh, health issues. Uh, he has extensive experience working on issues related to health systems, uh, sexual reproductive health, HIV and AIDS, gender-based violence and humanitarian assistance. Um, he was with IDEAS, uh, not sure for how long, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, representing the joint United Nations program on HIV AIDS under the UNDP, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. Okay, so that's it by way of introductions. Uh, can I uh, now uh, kindly invite the uh, more to make his uh, presentation? Thank you very much for this kind invitation to be with you today. Allow me to make a brief presentation. Uh, we have been, I'm mindful of the fact that we have rather limited time this afternoon. But also at this time of the day, it's often difficult to sustain people's attention. So let me be practical as well. Uh, allow me to... Um, um, Allow me to uh, first discuss, I'm going to focus my remarks on financing for healthcare in Malaysia. And specifically, I'm going to make a case for revenue financing uh, for Malaysian public healthcare. Now, uh, if we look at the whole record 
of health insurance, I'm going to make a strong case against health insurance, not against private or voluntary health insurance because that's an easy target, uh, but really against uh, so-called social health insurance. And this is very important for us to recognize. Uh, the the, the pro problems of private health insurance are very well known. Everybody makes jokes about the US uh, health system where you know, the United States spends about 80% 18, 18 of uh, national income on health. And their outcomes are not very impressive. They are number 40 in terms of life expectancy, and there are many other problems which I have recently been a victim of as well. But uh, that's another story. Now, allow me to just emphasize that there is very limited risk pooling. It is only for those who can afford it. Uh, and also, uh, you have problems of, of moral hazard uh, and cherry picking uh, among the, those involved, in fact, which, I, which can be quite self-evident for those of you who have thought through the problem. And then you have the very weak uh, negotiating power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the healthcare providers. Uh, so the result is that you have a strong, consistent tendency for upward cost pressures, and therefore it's not sustainable. So we have seen, for example, ever since I started looking at these, some of these issues about 15 years ago, the share of national income uh, in the United States, which is devoted to healthcare, uh, healthcare is actually gone up uh, rather than down. Uh, and you have very uh, a range of other problems as well. Now let me let me quickly uh, make the case for uh, revenue-based financing uh, against social health insurance. I'm emphasizing this because I want to be direct about what the, what the debate is about. Because there's no point taking an easy target and then you know it's a it's a bit of a, uh, it's, a it's it's a bit of a distraction. So what we have is that with revenue-based financing, you really have uh, risk pooling for larger populations. In fact, arguably it should be the entire population. It is much more effective, uh, efficient, and uh, co cost effective. And I'll come back to show you some of the evidence for this in a moment. And the third thing, of course, it is really much less expensive. So, for example, Malaysia spends somewhere in the region of about, uh, about, about less than two, about two point two percent, I think, of. of of uh, of of uh, of, um, of uh, national income uh, on health, and uh, we used to fare very very well uh, by international standards. We have slipped a lot for a variety of reasons, but mainly the neglect of preventable uh, non what are now called non communicable diseases. And, but nonetheless, I would argue that this is sustainable, and this is sustainable despite uh, un undeniable cost in, in, uh, increases in cost. Now, why do I say that uh, is more cost, cost effective? If you look at the international evidence, especially for the for the OECD countries, this is uh, this kind of data is only available, unfortunately, mainly for the OECD countries. You will find that um, the spending per capita for administration, okay, uh, in, in in the U.S. is almost double. Uh, what uh, cost others? Okay? Uh, now the only country here which has social health insurance among the, the, the list here is Germany, uh, but but uh, the U.S. is way higher than everybody else. But we'll come back to this uh, in a moment. Okay? Uh, so if you if you think about um, uh, what, what why are we, why are we arguing that SHI is not sustainable in the long term, and I'm using the V not Potentially as a royal we, but rather because there are there have been a group of health care financing campaigners who have been saying this, uh, and, and, and and one of the people involved is uh, Dr. Mary Cardosa, uh, who used to be a president of the Malaysian Medical Association, the only woman president of the Malaysian Medical Association. Now, if we look at at um, there are a whole range of problems. Um, of insurance, okay, which I won't get into right now, but I want to emphasize two things here. Uh, that provider-induced demand tends to result in cost escalation spirals. And this, I think, is a very important consideration uh, for everyone to think about. So, um, so what we have also, precisely because of the nature of insurance, any of you have ever had a motor accident, for example, 
you know how much how many checks there are to, to, to deter uh, insurance fraud of various types and so on and so forth. So there is a layer of insurance uh, uh, insurance management uh, which is actually quite considerable. Somewhere in the region of almost four percent of uh, cost, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the average. And one, one of course has to look at it more, much more carefully. Now looking at more uh, uh, in terms of the likely macroeconomic effects, um, when you when you impose uh, uh, social health insurance charges, uh, the likely effect is that for employers to minimize their cost, their, their liability, uh, they basically uh, resort to these uh, uh, devices, including informalizing their, their, their labor force. So rather they hire somebody directly, you can hire somebody indirectly uh, through uh, uh, contract labor arrangements of various types or <coughs> some other way. In other words, you result this one of the effects is greater informalization of labor and all the attendant consequences have much less uh, formal employment. And I would argue that, you, that, that this is prone to, it also contributes to the other macroeconomic challenges which we face, especially in developing countries. When we look at the world today, there are very, very few countries which have anything close to full employment. The US, for some very, very specific reasons, Singapore perhaps, and a couple of other countries, uh, particularly in the Gulf and so on. And Malaysia can make the case that, that it's, that it's, but you know, Malaysian labor statistics are completely unreliable, right? Everybody knows that, that we ignore uh, about two thirds of the, of the foreign workers who are, who are here, here uh, who are here by, by deeming them un undocumented. So there are a whole a lot of problems. Um, now, I also want to uh, emphasize that the insurance model, now this has become very stuck, the demo, so-called demographic dividend, which was talked about in the past, is now being undermined by you know, what, what everybody talks about, the demographic transition, which is happening in many, many of our societies. So the insurance model, including SHI, not just SHI, but all, including SHI, is, is going to be challenged increasingly by demographic considerations. And you also have, um, uh, uh, I've already mentioned in connection with the informality which was talked about, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, the likelihood that very less and less of the wage will be paid uh, through, through uh, uh, payroll financing. Steps. Now, look at this. I know it's very difficult for those of you in the back to see this, but I just want to point out that the health spending per capita, the, the most ex expensive in, in the world, uh, is the one on the left, of course, uh, which is the US. Now, you might not see the, the word under the second column next to the US. It's Germany. Okay? Germany is the most successful example, the most significant example of social health insurance. It has a lot to do with the Bismarckian social contract from the late 19th century, where you had the unions often providing that, that, the, 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 the health insurance arrangements, and members of the unions often entailed making health insurance contributions and various types and so on. That model has basically become increasingly unviable over the, over the decades, and what we, we see, even in Germany, is increasing revenue based finding, uh, re revenue financing uh, for 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 health. So it's often illusory to think that self uh, that social health insurance financing is adequate. Okay, one has to be very very uh, practical and hard nosed about this. Now let me quickly uh, uh, re uh, remind ourselves about what SHI uh, claims to address. One, it claims to raise more money. Um, and, and uh, I've already referred to some of the, the, the consequences. But most importantly, I want to emphasize that is that the impact of it is really regressive. When you consider the totality of taxes, because this is the, 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 the SHI charges are essentially a tax. So when you consider the totality of charges, it exacerbates the regressivity of the tax system. Now, we already know that ever since the colonial period, 
Uh, but even in the post-colonial post period, we have had a regressive tax structure. And, it's the, and the regressivity of income tax, uh, uh, sorry, the progressivity of income tax has been compromised by all the other taxes, the especially the indirect taxes. The other point, I think, which is very important to, to, to recognize is that when you have, in, 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 SHI also claims to integrate okay, uh, uh, public health care uh, with private care. So now, if you look at the, at, uh, the, the government white paper which uh, Professor Aslam just presented, uh, in fact, uh, the best, the, the ambition of the MOH is not to do that. Thing. So let's not pretend that there is any real ambition about integration, especially in the Malaysian context. But of course, you can think of it as an as an arrangement, which is not necessarily as disjointed and as disconnected as the one uh, envisaged here. Now, I want to emphasize the work of the late Adam Wagstar. Okay, Adam Wagstar passed away about a decade ago in Rome, where I had. Uh, where I was working at that time, uh, he was he had been just retired from the World Bank, and Adam Wagstaff and many of the people who worked very closely with him, who have since uh, left the World Bank, they are all over the uh, all over the place, mainly in academic jobs, but in other research jobs, uh, and, uh, and and very few of them are doing the kind of advocacy, certainly not from a pulpit such as that offered by the World Bank. But Wagstaff basically pointed out quite correctly, in my view, that the, the, you have much worse outcomes despite higher health expenditure uh, with SHI. And he basically attributes this to the increase, the increase because of the management of health insurance arrangements uh, without corresponding improvements in health outcomes. Okay? Just having spending more on management does not improve outcomes. Okay? That, that's very important. Then we have worse mortality rates for diseases which require strong health programs, because you do not, you have the neglect, the consequent neglect of public health programs as a consequence of it. Now, Wegstaff's work was not only for the World Bank, he published quite a number of papers with the OECD and uh, elsewhere, uh, and these are all available for those of you who are interested uh, to pursue this matter further. So, also I think it's important to recognize, and any government in, in this country, would have to recognize that if you try to move seriously towards SHI, you're not, it's going to be politically very, very unpopular. Okay? And, and this, I think, is a very important consideration. It's all very well to talk about the top 20% of the population being, uh, you know, Mahakarya. The fact of the matter is that the top 20% of the population is not Mahakarya. It's 0.2%, the top 0.2% of the population, which is Mahakarya. So let's be real about the world we live in, not in the world which we imagine, uh, or the world which consultants tell us is what, what we are living in. And if you look at that, at that situation very carefully, you, you, you basically see that, um, and, and this, the Madani government claims to be committed to inclusion, access, and also equity. Okay? And it violates all those principles. And of course, sustainability is also dubious for the reasons which I so there, are, there is undoubtedly a strong case to be made for all kinds of systemic reforms, including some of the proposals included in the health white paper, but which is now, for all intents and purposes, a dead letter, because this government is, is not committed to that, to that white paper. So as, as Professor Aslam has reminded us, there is a huge opportunity to open up the debate and open up the considerations for that debate at this juncture. So, um, so I think it's, it's I, I won't go through this because I'm really running out of time, but I think it's very important for us to think very seriously about, about what it's likely to, to, to do. Now, if you think about the top 20%, okay, what happens with the top 20% in this country? They're not Mahakaya. Most of them might go to private health care facilities providers for for routine matters. But when it comes to catastrophic healthcare demands, they fall back on the government. Look at the number of people who are queuing up 
to go to uh, National Health Institute, National Heart Institute, or alternatively to the, uh, to, to the Saddam Hospital. But what we have now, because of this commitment to beginning this kind of autonomous system, is a non-system. My, my former professor, uh, the late Robert Trippin, referred to the system after the end of Bretton Woods when, when, when Richard Nixon ended it in 1971 as a non-system. And this is precisely what is dangerous. If you go to if you go to the government to the Slang Hospital, which is considered to be the most advanced hospital in the government system, if, if you go to the to, to the Slang Hospital, they will probably uh, refer if you have a, a problem with diabetes, which is very very common in Malaysia. Almost one quarter of the population suffers from diabetes, either type one or type two. If you go to Slang Hospital, the diabetes expert, one diabetes expert in public service is to be found in Putrajaya. Now, why is he in the Putrajaya hospital? Because the incidence of diabetes is highest in Putrajaya, which says a, lot, a little bit about lifestyles of people in, 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 in Putrajaya, but I won't get into that right now. But the, the point to be made is that you can't have a system over some fundamental problem which affects so much of the population by referring them to Putrajaya. This, we need a far better system right now, and the incentives, particularly for public health, particularly for preventive health, are such that we do we have a neglect of them. We, those students who are, those med, med, uh, doctors, sorry, who are <coughs> specialized, tend to go to specializations where they can get a return for their so-called private, private investment. Okay, this is the, these are the incentive structures. So I think it's very important for us to begin to think very importantly about how to ensure a motivated public service. And let's face it, the public service, not everybody in the public service, and many people in the public service who remain in the public service to the end of the career, it's not because they're incompetent, not because they cannot, they cannot earn their own keep in the private sector, but because many of them are genuinely committed to public service. So we really need to create systems of incentive. Now, Many of you might not be aware, there was an MMA uh, uh, report, commission report, in the year 1980. Uh, it's the latest people who have passed away, and the last survivor of that commission report is Hansi Baka Okay, he, If you press it on this, because he has been associated with many other things since then, but if you press it on those reports, we, will tell, we, will give, we can tell you a lot about what what is needed to change the effect incentive structure uh, in, in public health services. But I'm, I'm uh, debating from what I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to speak about. So let me just uh, 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 move on quickly. It's important to remember about half of so-called non-communicable diseases in this country remain undiagnosed. Now the very fact that they're undiagnosed is that you run into the Donald Rumsfeld problem. Okay? The unknown, you know, you know, we don't really know how to how to estimate that. But given given the number of people, uh, my, 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 one of my schoolmates uh, was the late Khalid Khalid, who, who passed away a few months ago. Khalid basically started a campaign against diabetes when he, when he started uh, practice uh, in the late 1970s and the late, late 1990s. Before he passed away, I went to see him, knowing that he didn't have long to go, and say, Khalid, you, know, you did a lot of important things for the country by starting that campaign. He said, Jomo had literally failed. And he said that with a great regret, because when he started out according to him, the number of people with diabetes, mainly type 1 diabetes, was in single digits. By the, by the time he passed, the figure is closer to a quarter. And this is the situation which we have in this country. So these preventable problems, okay, which have come about through lifestyle and other problems, and we need to do, to do something about this. So I think it's very important for us to recognize that a lot of preventive and public and, and public health issues uh, are, are under under financed right now. There are a whole range, for example, of, of conditions which are specific to women. There are a whole range of conditions which are specific to young people. The whole range of conditions are specific to old people. None of them get the kind of treatment which which is which uh, or attention which is due to them. Now. 
I won't get into uh, this particular bar chart, but I think it's important to remember that Malaysians spend less on health um, uh, than, than in most comparable countries. So we had a pretty good uh, track record, I would argue, until the 1980s. It has gone down slowly over the years, and now today many people would say that the Thai system has, come, has, has, has improved uh, and, and is better than the Malaysian system. I am more ambiguous about this. I think it is important to remember that this was basically achieved by what I have termed the, the Mahidol reforms. Mahidol is a leading royal medical university, and many of them are the smartest people in Thailand who went into, into medicine for the usual reasons, and they uh, you know, uh, had an opportunity to bring about reforms from about two decades ago, mainly when Taksin was in the government, and they, 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 did, they, did very, they did very well for themselves. Now, so what are the challenges right now? I think we have under-resources, under-resourced, I mean, we all know this, uh, loss of experienced staff because of the incentives, uneven improvements in health indicators, and most importantly, unlike uh, 40 years ago, we have huge, powerful health insurance lobbies. I work in the central area. If you look at the buildings in the central area, three belong to insurance companies. There are two, uh, sorry, four belong to insurance companies. One to a sing two to once a single insurance company. Okay, these are all things which have been achieved mainly at the expense of all those people who pay. And the, and the amazing thing, of course, is that uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Cupex. Okay, the Confederation of Employees in the Public Sector. Instead of defending the public public health care system and trying to improve it, they were the first to try to develop a, 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 a deal with the with the with the private insurance companies. Now, sub subsequently, it has become very clear that it was all corruption. Okay, the, 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 the union leader got a political position and so on and so forth. But this is the nature of public policy making in this country, and we cannot afford to be held to ransom by people like that. So I think it's very important for us to renew a commitment to, and to, to the public health, but not as it is, but as it should be. And this, I think, needs to be done and if we, we deserve uh, 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 to have a decent discussion about how this might be best done uh, in the context of Malaysia. Uh, there are various norms, both national as well as international norms, norms associated with the Madani idea, for example, and so on and so forth, but I could leave it for one discussion uh, and, uh, on, uh, after this. Let me also emphasize that there are whole, I'm not suggesting that none of the health care system reforms which are proposed uh, in the white paper uh, deserve attention. There are many important points which it makes uh, by virtue of being a comprehensive and This, I think, is extremely important. So let me stop here because I've already, uh, the chairman has been very indulgent. And I've already exceeded my time. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, the lesson is never, never put uh, a moderator as your uh, ex student should never be a moderator of your. Uh, as well, conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and very good uh, afternoon. Thank you so much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, comment on, on this issue and certainly it's uh, quite an honor and a pleasure to be on the same panel as uh, Prof. Jomo, who is actually a single name guy, you know, you don't need an introduction, just say Jomo, you know who it is. It's like Chair, Elvis, you know, Taylor. You know, so, uh, but I just wanted to make a little bit of a comment and, you know, when I came in today, uh, I actually thought it was only 30 minutes in the session, so I thought we need that for start deck, right? So I thought I'd just uh, go ahead. But then I saw uh, Prof. Jomo's uh, slide deck just now, I felt pressured. <laughs> there's charts, there's text there, you know, and so I have to follow up. And so uh, I'm going to be using a slide deck and use for uh, another uh, roundtable discussion, but it's very appropriate for this discussion because healthcare financing is something that the Galen Center for Health and Social Policy is very much involved in, and certainly uh, we have been talking about it for the past, well, since the inception, in, back in 2017. 
Uh, just a quick comment following uh, Prof. Jumo's um, uh, uh, presentation just now. So can I just say that, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm one of those who is an advocate of national health insurance, social health insurance. So we are on opposite ends, really, on, on this issue. Uh, and, um, uh, oh, just thought, you know, uh, Prof. Jumo, uh, uh, the current president of the Malaysian Medical Association is a woman. Prof. Aziza, so it's really good progress there for, for women in, in the healthcare for the community. That leadership is increasingly more women. Um, can I just make a comment on the white paper? The white paper has evolved uh, since it was first conceived uh, by the former health minister, uh, KJ. When you look at the white paper as it is today, which is uh, what was passed by parliament uh, last year, uh, it is um, very different than the original uh, vision that uh, KJ had when he put it together. And the idea was to be more akin to the defense white paper, which is this 200 behemoth page behemoth that's been used like the, the Bible and stuff, you know, uh, for purposes of defense industry. But what happened was, was that with the change in government uh, and um, a new direction, a new minister, you know, KJ wanted to have a white paper a document that you threw everything at it. You know, you put everything in it because this is the document that's going to be passed by Parliament and therefore you could make use of it whenever you wanted to reference the reforms that you have in the future. Because everything, you know, Parliament already gave its holy seal in it, so Kaptima. The problem here was that with the change of government and uh, change in leadership, the white paper that was developed uh, was basically, let's just put what we think is acceptable and don't offend anyone. So you ended up with a less ambitious white paper. And also, if you if you look into it, you find that it's uh, short and there is a dearth of things like targets, milestones, uh, objectives, what we want to see, what kind of uh, healthy Malaysian, what we're talking about, like diabetes, what we want to see after 15 years, you know, what kind of targets that we want to see from a population perspective. So it was very much short that as much more broader in terms of the document. So when we spoke to them, they said, well, basically, we just put out the frame. It's up to you to populate the frame. So that could work. But that means there's a lot of work on our side in trying to populate uh, this framework that they have put together because we wanted to start with an advantage when we're talking with policy makers, you know, something that's committed to. So, you know, the white paper unfortunately today you know, falls off the radar for a lot of people because it doesn't say enough of anything. And so the commitment also is less because it doesn't say anything. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there uh, before we start uh, the, the discussion here and because this is where we are starting from. And so I just wanted to say that um, when it comes to Malaysia, Malaysia is actually in a state of multiple crises. I don't know if you been keeping up with the news concerning health, but there are multiple crises that are happening all at the same time. Nobody's waiting their turn. It's all happening. And contrary to the great marketing that we have done with regards to Malaysian healthcare, Malaysian healthcare today is really in a, uh, it, it, it's not sustainable. The way we finance it's not sustainable. The way we're uh, recruiting the staff, healthcare professionals, is not sustainable. The way that we are uh, making demands of the system is not sustainable. And so we are coming to a point where we have to talk about reform, but what are we talking about? How does reform look like? So I would hazard, and I would put together in the immediacy two crises that we actually have to deal with. One is the non chronic diseases crisis, which was briefly mentioned by Prof. Jomo a moment ago, where the National Health and Mobility Survey, which is done by the Ministry of Health, was just uh, launched a couple of weeks ago, NHMS 2023, uh, the findings were made available. And these findings build upon the previous work that was done. And what we know is, it's worse than what Prof. Jomo mentioned just now, actually. Today, half a billion people in Malaysia are living with four non communicable diseases. Not one, two, four <coughs> together. This includes diabetes, hypertension, uh, hypercholesteremia, and obesity, for which half, 54% of the population is now overweight or obese. 
It's quite serious. And 2.3 million people are living with three NCDs, a combination of the four that I mentioned just now. Diabetes, which to be honest, when I first thought about it, I didn't realize that would be much of a, uh, an issue really in terms of health care, but it turns out this is the foremost issue of concern for Malaysians today. I thought it was going to be cancer, I thought it was going to be cardiovascular disease, no, it's diabetes, because it is pretty much the causal ingredient for all the other diseases as well. And of that, we see 16% of the population are living with diabetes, basically one in six. 84% um, don't know that they have diabetes. And it is projected that by uh, next year, actually, we would have 7 million people living with either pre or already diabetic, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. 7 million people. And so when it comes to non communicable diseases, uh, diabetes is very much there. We have, of course, kidney disease, you know. Uh, SOCSO, the uh, Social Security uh, Organization, receives annually 6,000 applications to be on the SOCSO uh, uh, kidney. Don't worry about the slide. I, I uh, the, the, the kidney, um, to be on, on subsidized kidney dialysis, 6,000. They've already said by 2030, we're going to close shop. We can't, we can't do it anymore. You know, we we got to put a stop to it. And that's just a couple of years down the road. Uh, cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer. Uh, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, mortality rates in, in uh, private hospitals. And so when it comes to the NCD crisis, diabetes costs the taxpayer around uh, 3.4 billion ringgit each year. Uh, sorry, 4.3 billion ringgit each year, which is the bulk against cancer and cardiovascular disease. So the NCD crisis is one. The second crisis that is very much on the horizon today is unpreparedness with regards to aging population. Now, there's been a lot of talk about how we is approaching aging population. By this, by 2030, we are going to be at 15.3% of the population is going to be age, meaning those above the age of 65. The reality is, is that we're really an aged nation today. We are, at the moment, 6% of the population above the age of 65. And the fact is, is that the needs of those who are aged is definitely a lot more than those who are not. Uh, in terms of healthcare costs, it costs four to five times more for an aged individual for inpatient and outpatient care compared to one who is not. So the problem right now is, is that this is the backdrop of two, I'm not even saying the rest, I'm just saying two of uh, the, I would argue, the immediate crisis that we actually have to deal with, and for which we have to find out what kind of reforms we can introduce. And I will present to you four reforms that I think we need to be able to do, and there's no low hanging fruit, unfortunately. These things need to be done, they need to be done today, but it involves years of work and possibly uh, billions of ringgit of, of uh, possibly tax funding are uh, needed for that purposes. But that's to set the context for you in terms of, of where we would want to come from. And I think for the next round table, which is coming after this, which focuses specifically on health care financing, this context setting is very important. Uh, so let me let me talk to you a little bit about healthcare financing today. You know, when we talk about healthcare financing, we seem to only think that it only comes from one source. And the reality is that Health expenditure comes from multiple sources, and you can see there uh, on the slide there, which does not just mean Ministry of Health, it also means Ministry of Education, Ministry of Defense, uh, out of pocket spending, meaning household income, savings, insurance you have there, employers also. So you can see it's a multitude of sources there which go towards funding curative care, medical goods, and preventive care. One main issue that we always need to consider when we're talking about healthcare in Malaysia. 70% of the population accesses public healthcare. And after the COVID uh, Q, you know, the crisis period, this is expected that it is now moved from 70% to possibly even 80%. We don't have an uh, uh, updated estimation, but possibly now increasingly more people are dependent on the uh, 
public healthcare system for their health needs. So it's very important that whatever we're talking about is placed within that context. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk about how much we're we're spending compared to other countries and so forth. But, uh, and I apologize for giving you 2020 data, that's actually a newer slide. But we are actually increasingly uh, high in terms of how much we spend each year on health. It's uh, expected to increase exponentially because of the <coughs> NCD uh, explosion, but also due to aged care as well. And you can see that it's a steady increase but what we don't talk about enough is actually about the investment in, in, in health when you talk about it against the GDP. We like to talk about 5%, you know, I think it was uh, highlighted during KJ's period that we wanted to get 5% uh, expenditure for uh, the country. But the reality is, is that we have actually exceeded 5% today when it comes to GDP uh, expenditure, both public and private. Public and private both, and um, again, apologies, this is 2020 data. If you look at it, it's around 5.4% today when it comes to health expenditure, out of which around 54% is public expenditure. So when he says we need 5% GDP, he's not talking about 5% overall expenditure. He was referencing the public expenditure so think about that. The current expenditure that we need to have is actually 100% more than we currently budget today. Very important. Because you've got to figure out where the money is going to come from. Which means that we have to add on, if today it's 41.2 billion, which is the budgeted uh, health uh, allocation for 2024, we now have to double that amount in order to meet the 5% target that we're talking for. A health expenditure for public health care. Where's the money going to come from, right? So if you look in the past, in terms of distribution, and you can see there, public still leads in terms of uh, expenditure, you can see that we have to find the money from another source because at the end of the day, the money isn't, just isn't there. However we work the numbers, how we, however we squeeze uh, the the, the uh, government for funding, we see an increment of around 10 to 15 percent each year. This year has been the largest amount allocated for health since ever, but every year we say that anyway. You know? But basically, 41.2 billion is definitely not the largest that we've, we've allocated for health so far. But it's still not enough. So, if you see in terms of uh, per capita expenditure on health, you can see that like, that's uh, per capita. We see it also in terms of breakdown, and I just want to show this slide to you before I, 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 I stop, is that some states spend more on health than others. And you can see that for Penang, which has a high density of aged individuals, they're spending a lot more compared to other states as well. So you can see how much in terms of investment is going. So there's a lot more I can show the slides, but I wanted to also mention this to you. Whenever we allocate budgets for the Ministry of Health, there is a very big problem that we actually have to address, which is that whatever money that goes into the new allocation that is given to the Ministry of Health for Health gets immediately absorbed by the huge remuneration, the emoluments budget that we need to actually spend. So you end up with, even though you've given new money or billions in new money for health, it just gets it, it, it just gets absorbed by this behemoth, which is the salaries and, and, and uh, the uh, emoluments, the contracts and so forth, when the actual money going for care is less than 10%, consistently over the past, past 10 years. In order for us to see the changes that we need, the investment in infrastructure, the changes, the reform that we're talking about, we need this allocation for the operating, so the uh, development expenditure to be increased by at least 15 to 20 percent. So it was mentioned just now in terms of the white paper, it's you know, moving from sick care. But I wanted to, to leave you with, with four items which uh, I feel that we need to be able to do. The first one is to reform the healthcare financing uh, model. 
that we have today, tax dependent uh, financing is not sustainable currently, it is broken because it is unable to adequately finance the needs of what we estimate to be the, the, the healthcare needs of the population today. We are actually not with enough knowledge of how much gap are we seeing between what we're funding versus what we need. But the gap is expected to be quite large and as I mentioned to you, simply talking about the 5% uh, GDP target will talk about an additional 41 billion. The 41 billion is not anywhere in the current uh, budget that the government has, and we need to be able to do that if we want to reach 5%. <coughs> the problem here also is in relation to the implementation of uh, the healthcare reforms that we need to be able to do today with our healthcare professionals. Prof. Yomo hinted earlier in this presentation. The problem right now is that there is a mass exodus, a hemorrhage of healthcare professionals from the Malaysian healthcare system, from the public healthcare system. Uh, nurses, doctors, specialists are leaving the healthcare system in mass. Huge departments, whole departments are being denuded because of a number of reasons. It's not just about the pay. A lot of people will want to, you know, contribute to be part of a national effort and they don't mind seeing the pay. But one of the main reasons that they are leaving is because dissatisfaction in the workplace, concerning workplace policies, workplace environment, harassing, bullying, sexual harassment, there's been sexual uh, abuse, many of which these issues have not been addressed. There's the issue of contract versus permanent. And we have started to see as a result of, uh, you know, lacking compassion, human resource policies, lacking compassion, and I can go into detail about it later if you, if you wish to know, but basically things that are unacceptable in the private sector, uh, human resource environment, are being tolerated in the government of the healthcare. And we're losing people for very strange reasons. We are unable to recruit more, and today we have a dearth, uh, sorry, we have a gap uh, of around at least 6,000 doctors versus what we actually need. The third is that we need to implement a crash program for the modernization and digitalization of our electronic medical records. Uh, uh, Dr. Zhou, the current health minister, is currently embarking on a project to modernize our healthcare system using uh, digital technology uh, and to ensure that we are able to gain from the the benefits of digitalization, which can be cost saving, you know, there's force multipliers as well. And we saw during COVID how much, you know, uh, digital health could play a role, and they're trying to do that. I have to tell you, one of the shocking things I heard uh, a few years ago uh, concerning the most modern uh, hospital that we have here, supposedly, is that patient notes are being shared through Google Docs. Patient notes, which are confidential medical information, but because it's easiest to just, you know, adjust, amend, and so on, Google Doc, so they do it with Google Doc, which is totally unacceptable. And the fourth, which is a little bit controversial, is that we need a moratorium on new uh, healthcare facilities. Every politician seems to demand a new clinic a new hospital, a new dialysis center, all these infrastructure that they feel would be popular, would fulfill a need, but guess what? You can build the building, you can buy the equipment, but you cannot populate that healthcare facility. We do not have enough nurses, we do not have enough doctors, we do not have enough specialists, and so we have had a situation, I'll give you an example, Cyberjaya Hospital, which was opened last year, ended up taking nurses and doctors and administrators from facilities around the Clown Valley area in order for that hospital to operate. So it's a you know, new facility, but it actually caused more problems. So I wanted to leave that with you, but perhaps this slide would help also inform 
uh, why we should reform the current system of healthcare. And I think Prof. Jomo has mentioned quite a bit uh, just now, but I just wanted to mention one point here, which is misrepresentation of expenditure. Today, the Malaysian, um, the, the average Malaysian is fed the belief that Malaysian healthcare is cheap, is affordable. Private healthcare is expensive, unaffordable, and unreasonable. The fact of the matter is, is that healthcare in Malaysia does not cost one ringgit or five ringgit. A lot of people feel that this is how much healthcare costs. People do not see the actual cost of providing healthcare in Malaysia, for which the cost for both public and private are almost similar, but that the taxpayer subsidizes 98% of the public, uh, the, the, the bill for someone to access the public health care system. The question that we should and need to answer for the future, how do we sustain the current situation? How do we continue to provide 98%? Is there another way forward? Can we co-pay? Like who pays uh, for some of it and the government pays for some of it? Or should there be a national health insurance where there's a pooling? of resources, uh, of risks, not something that replaces the existing system, but complements <coughs> The problem right now, if you see in the UK, for example, National Health Insurance, uh, Rishi Sunak, I'm sure you've seen right now, they're about to go into a general election, has basically pledged for populist reasons, political reasons, to decrease the contribution to National Health Insurance. What the NHS is worried about today is with the decrease in contribution by the public into the national health insurance, will it impact the delivery of care in the NHS? Because the money has got to come out from somewhere. Reducing contributions means people might get less of services. So I just want to leave this slide with you and uh, welcome any questions and any comments. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of points uh, will keep us busy uh, for a long time. Um, now, I've just been told that the chairperson that's supposed to moderate this next thing is not here, so it looks like I'm going to continue um, to, to moderate. Um, I think the, the mention about uh, the National Health Service moves very nicely to the second part of the discussion. Um, just as a pointer, revenue-based financing, and you were saying a national health insurance scheme or a social health scheme. These are two maybe very different approaches to funding. Um, we have three discussants who are going to uh, give their comments. Uh, firstly, uh, Professor Jeffrey Williams, um, founder director of Williams Business Consultancy. Um, he's been in Malaysia for more than 20 years, uh, Jeff, right? and uh, he's been with quite a number of uh, private universities, Uni Raza Health Institute, and the latest was uh, Malaysian University of Science and Technology. Um, ah, okay. So you want to come and take over? <laughs> you, are, you are allocated as the chairperson. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it uh, looks like I'll just continue. Um, and uh, so, so he will be the first speaker. Um, secondly, we have Dr. Amjad Ravi, visiting expert at University of Malaya's <coughs> Social Wellbeing Research Center. Uh, prior to joining the center, he was Chief Technical Advisor on Social Security for the ILO Office in Iraq. Uh, he had earlier served as Social Security Advisor to the EPF. Uh, the third uh, speaker will be Ms. Lin Hoi Meng, uh, Manager, Policy and Strategy Department in EPF. Uh, prior to joining EPF, she was Research and Data Specialist at the United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF. Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing of this. Uh, and Ministry of Health Malaysia. She was a key member of the project teams for the National Health Protection Scheme for B40 population, or PECA B40, uh, Health Insurance Coverage Scheme for Foreign Workers, uh, 
uh, malicious health system research, enhanced primary health care program, etc. So we have the three speakers, and in order to have time for Q&A and everybody's participation, uh, for discussions, please, 10 minutes. Uh, it's not Jasmine will come after you. <laughs> okay, so please, Jen. Okay, thanks. <coughs> My Polish would look if I might yes, I'm actually rather older than, than I might appear. And uh, when I first went to university in Cambridge, 30, more than 30 years ago, the first lecture in the first course for the entire first year of 400 economists was on health funding 30 years ago by Professor uh, Jeffrey Hartford. And the reason I bring that up is because many of the things that Jeff Harcourt mentioned to us then, more than three decades ago, are exactly the type of issues that Prof. John Mohas rightly pointed out uh, in his observations. Um, and of course, this is from a British perspective where we have a National Health Service. So everything there was about why do we have a National Health Service? Why don't we have a at that time? Nothing by way of private health care. Nothing at all. Even at that time, prescription charges, there were no prescription charges. Everything was free. Visiting the doctor, seeing the doctor, the medicines, everything was free. And the first question that we were being asked to um, think about as undergraduates directly into the, into the program is why do we do that? And the answer is that economists, economists know why, and we have known for many, many, many decades that the only feasible way of providing a universal healthcare system is through direct funding from the government. And I say that as uh, as I'm knows. I say that as a former advisor to the Conservative Party and market economist. I am a market non-interventionist market economist. Absolutely no way would I have an intervention from the government in almost every area of economic activity, but not in health. Because health is quintessentially the place where the market fails. That's why we use health more often than any other um, example when we are teaching about market failure, uh, particularly insurance market failure, and so on. So, my starting point is to make is to make that observation. Economists know these issues very well. We know that the health market fails, and we know that we cannot find market solutions to those market failures, as we might in other forms of market failure. We know that the only real way of providing universal health care is through tax, government tax funding. In the UK, we call it the National Insurance Contribution. It's not a National Insurance Scheme. It isn't an insurance scheme. It's tax. So when you mention that uh, the current <coughs> Conservative government won't be there for much longer, uh, that they, are, they, they were uh, proposing to reduce the National Insurance Contribution, that's true. But they are reducing one tax and raising another tax. We have the highest tax in the United Kingdom since 1949. So the entire health service in the United Kingdom will be funded from tax. It may not be funded from the national insurance contribution, but it will be able to be funded from tax. So even conservatives know that, and even conservatives understand that. After the national health service was established in the United Kingdom after the Second World War, actually, the Conservatives never cut spending on the National Health Service. Never. It always increased, even under the Conservatives. And that is uh, part of our commitment to that. <clears throat> Which brings me adding to this issue of the 5%, this so called 5% rule, which you mentioned. And what I, you know, I thought I wouldn't have very much to say about it because you already answered the question. But the truth is that Malaysia does spend more than 5% on healthcare. It does. But that is a combination of public spending and private spending. But we need to ask the question, where does this 5% come from? 
It doesn't come from economists. Because any economist would look at this 5% and say, this makes absolutely no sense. Singapore and Malaysia have about the same GDP, if you readjust it and measure it in the same currency. But Singapore has a population one-fifth of Malaysia. So if Singapore spends 5% of its GDP and Malaysia spends 5% of its GDP, Singapore will be spending five times as much on every Singaporean as Malaysia. Are they five times more unhealthy? No. If you spend five times more, would they be five times more healthy? No. Would they get five times better quality of healthcare if you spend five times more money? No. No, they wouldn't. What would happen? The price of the health care would go up. It would be five times more expensive, but not five times better. So this 5% rule has absolutely no meaning in economic terms. There's no meaning. Because Malaysia already spends it. Right? The question is, why is it a, why do we have this insistence that it should be 5% of public spending? That's because when you have a mix of public spending and private spending, you have a deficiency in the overall healthcare provision. But it's about the mix and how that is done that, that causes the deficiency. And certainly in Malaysia, <coughs> that is the problem. In my opinion. It's not the amount of money that is being spent, which already meets the 5% if you believe the 5%. It's how it's being spent. And the deficiency is the balance between the public healthcare system and the private healthcare system. And as a foreigner, I only use, I only allow to use the private system. But because I've been here 20 years with my family, I also know about the public system. The private healthcare system is a cesspit. The public healthcare system is a cesspit. And it's not because of lack of money. So if we look at the third issue, which is the most important issue in my view, about the system uh, of uh, healthcare care relation, it's about the management of the system. It's not the money. It is a, a partly the balance of the money, public versus private. We I should also point out, there is no such thing, of course, as government money. Government has no money. Government money comes from me and from you, right? So when you talk about public spending on public health, the rakyat is spending money on public health. It's the rakyat's money. It's not the government's money, right? So then they spend the money on the public health, and they spend the money on the private health. Where does the money for the private health come from? 85% comes out of their pocket, not out of the insurers. Uh, private health insurance. Private health insurance is 7% total spending. 15% private spending, so you pointed out. It's roughly about half of that. The percentage has changed a little bit because of the COVID spending. Roughly about half. The private health insurance system in Malaysia is tiny, 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 tiny. But there is a corrupt nexus between the private insurance system and the private hospital. There is. There's no question about it. There's a definite corrupt nexus there. And that leads to the third issue, which is the nature of the management of the health system as a whole. Who is it who manages the health system? It's the medical professionals themselves. Okay. So the health ministry, who do you see there? Do you see public health economists or management specialists? No. You see pediatricians and radiologists and in, in management schools, we have something called accidental managers. <coughs> accidental managers are people who have been promoted in a, into a position of management because there's any way they can raise their salary or improve their career options. In most instances, that causes deficiencies in management. But in healthcare, people die as a consequence. 
And that is a big problem, in my view. It's one of the biggest problems. It's the question of it's the behavioral economics of who is managing this system. And when you have a healthcare system managed by healthcare professionals, people who are trained as pediatricians and radiologists or ear, nose, and throat specialists, dealing with public policy issues on very difficult things that economists, after many decades, have come to a consensus on left, right, or center. When that system is managed by people who are not properly trained in that area, they're accidental managers, then you get the deficiency. And that's, that's a big issue that I see um, as, a, as a problem for the relation analysis. Thank you, Jeff. So we, we have discussion on the sources of funding. Now we are taken into another uh, huge area. So of course you need, you need the funds, but equally important is Management. It's management. Um, and I think we can actually say that about nearly every other thing, yeah, not only in Malaysia, but in all other countries. Uh, I, was, I was listening, there was a report a few weeks ago. Uh, 277 billion ringgit have leaked out of the system over the last five years or something, right? So, so that's an incredible amount of money. So, so this idea of management, and of course, connected to that is this big thing of corruption. Um, it's something else that we have to think about when we're talking about uh, reforms. And I think I just want to connect it. it. It goes back to the strategic purchaser, which is being proposed uh, to solve all these problems, right? And, and therefore, it's going to be run very well, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's an important point. Thank you, Jeff. OK, Dr. Jeff, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmad Khartoum. If you may, please pass. Just for clarity, I think maybe I go straight to the point and I uh, put my question up there clear. I think I follow Prof. Jonas uh, that social health insurance, you should be very careful about it. Very, very careful about it. And I totally agree with uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Jeffrey as well. So, and the reason, and this is, it's also like I consider it a man, is that we need to say the truth, you know, because this is like uh, I learned from uh, Mr. Aswell, and uh, hopefully we can uh, share openly our question. And where the money comes from, maybe I'll start from the obvious, uh, the 83 billion ringgit last year uh, was spent on gasoline subsidy and other form of subsidy. When health and education, if you combine them, those are the most important two ministries. If you combine it, combine them, they will come to the same level. So it's not that there is no spending, but it's long spending pattern. And I will build on this one, but just to quickly, I mean, this is obviously we discussed this. Uh, Malaysia is not spending a lot, and we need to get ourselves maybe out of the uh, uh, mindset that we talk in billions of ringgits. Sometimes the billions of ringgits, it's absolute ten, like billions of ringgits. If I go back to 1980 and say that we spend. Uh, at one point for health, about 40 billion ringgit, that will be uh, too much for them, but obviously for the size of the economy. But not to spend a lot of uh, time on this one, but Malaysia has done well. I mean, you usually look at infant mortality, it's just a quick indicator. Malaysia has done well relative to very small amount of money that uh, Malaysia spent. Sorry, it's moving faster than what I thought. Oops, maybe I was a little bit excited. Sorry. Yeah, let me go back. Yeah? So, what I wanted to go straight to where uh, my training, I'm actually, I work in actuary in, uh, in the field of actuary, creating a foundation for social health insurance in many countries. So not ideologically I'm against it, but just I let numbers speak and try to understand country uh, uh, different than other countries. Generally speaking, we look at one formula that for the contribution rate, but we can think about it for the tax rate to fund the system. You have two things, you know, how much their person, the benefit that I will get. And there is another one, uh, the dependency ratio. The multiplication of this will give us, the product of them will give us like how we should expect the contribution rate, how it will be. I'll take one by one. I mean, it's all, I will state the obvious that everyone knows. The benefit ratio 
certainly will increase like the benefit per person, let's say. And simply because of uh, the aging phenomenon, as uh, uh, Mr. Azrul highlighted, the cost will be much higher. What we in, uh, 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 in economics, we use the term J curve. And the J curve is simply, you have lower utili uh, higher utilization for the first two, year, two years of life, and then it goes down <coughs> to the middle and it's not escalating as uh, when you get older. So with the same population, if you shift to higher to age population, as we see here in Malaysia, it's uh, growing relatively fast. Even with the same population, we should expect higher uh, because of the J-curve uh, phenomenon. So the benefit ratio, I wanted to say that we will pay X per person because of the demographic. And the dependency ratio, the other one, this is how a senior citizen relative to the working age population is increasing rapidly. Now, if you put the two together, what you would see that one arrow here, one arrow here, so that course will escalate. So we need to come to this conclusion that healthcare, no way that you contain the course. It's, we would see it increasing, and this is in comparison to countries that went through this population transition. Malaysia is not, it's still young, it's still young. When we talk about Malaysia now, we can age 30 years old, actually. Uh, it's like this. So 30 years old, if you compare it just for uh, developed countries, uh, in OECD countries, about 44 years old. So we know we're still there, but we, we, this is having an increasing rapidity. So the point, the first point that cost will increase. Whatever we do, cost will increase because of, the, uh, of this uh, situation. It's the question is uh, where, where I limit my uh, presentation to is where we get financing. And wanted to highlight again the premiums will escalate. If you introduce social health insurance today at 4%, um, to, uh, um, 2020, you have 10 workers for each senior citizen. 2050, you have four workers for each senior citizen. It means you need to multiply your contribution for, for four times. So every election, you need to double your, your uh, contribution pay, for, and that's impossible. Cost to this pay, that's for sure. So we need to, look, to learn, as Prof. Jom highlighted, like in Germany, they're looking at how they spread the tax burden. Because you don't want to keep add to that or really high contribution rate. Contribution rate in Malaysia is high. EPF, 24%. 23-24%. You have SOXO. So how much you're going to add to the like, You're already taking one-fourth of the working age population and you to maintain. If you produce social health insurance, you keep increasing it. There is a limit. And now Indonesia introduced social health insurance, uh, uh, I mean mixed uh, approach, but contribution rate in Indonesia is 4%, whereas well, in Malaysia, 24%. So I think the social health insurance for this specific fact. Um, excuse me, EPF is 11%. 11 percent. 11 work up. Yeah. yeah. Work. Oh, yeah, yes, it's 24. But, but just, it's apples and oranges, though, so I just wanted to be sure. No, it's not apples and oranges. So. Can I, can I, so, yeah, it's not apples and oranges. Usually in economics, you can impose the tax on chef and it doesn't mean he will pay it. Usually there is uh, something that you shift the tax. So we usually look at the total tax, because even if you improve, impose it in employers, doesn't mean because there is elasticity and uh, But anyway, the point is 24% employer employees indicated to EPF, and this, uh, we know the adequacy issues. So the social health insurance, really based on numbers, as an actual, I don't have ideological uh, point of view here, is kind of you know limited uh, uh, what you can do. Secondly, what one percent, one percent adding contribution, how much it will generate? It will generate uh, four, four billion ringgit for each one percent. So you need 10 percent to get 40 billion ringgit. So it's very limited. Now, what, what I wanted to say is the options, you know. And I, I agree that we need a reliable source of funding. That's for sure, that's a fact, factual. So instead of imposing it in those who work, who already pay a lot, and just for us to know those who work, if you have population in the working age in Malaysia, we have about 25 million, 25 uh, million. What are the, those who work within that group? It's about 10, uh, 10 uh, the labor force uh, uh, together uh, 17, but the ones they contribute to EPF, 8.5 million, the ones they contribute to the public sector is one. So it's about 
uh, uh, 1.2. So about 10 million maximum out of the 25 million world language. So you're going to impose only on those you're not going to capture the format as a prof show more highlighted. So instead of focusing on this group, which they already pay a lot and they cannot buy houses, they, you know, life is difficult now. The argument is to spread the tax. Spread it through uh, the indirect tax. <coughs> and I put two things here. The one is obvious, the subsidy. I mean, we need to talk about it. I mean, wanted to bring example about subsidy here. Initially, when we always look at OECD countries, but actually best uh, examples sometimes come from countries that reform under repression. Iran, because of the pressure, they reformed their subsidy. So, and you know, you would imagine it's fuel subsidy is very sensitive. The middle uh, uh, class can go against the government quickly. So what they did, they said we're going to inject for each household 29% of the median income for each household. So we remove the subsidy, fuel subsidy, and inject cash payment of 29 sizable. At the same time, they said we're going to increase. Uh, allocation to public health. And they, as you can see here the graph, they increased significantly the allocation to public health. The reform was very popular, very, very popular in Iran. Everyone appreciated health. It's very uh, uh, close to everyone. At the same time, it reduced poverty uh, by 50%. And more importantly, it reduced in, in rural area. 50% in a matter of two years that you cut poverty because of the smart uh, move. The second one is tax. I don't want to talk a lot about it because we know where is Malaysia. And it's, it's, it's interesting how Malaysia deteriorated the tax GDP. Usually when income increases, tax GDP increases as we see OECD countries 34%. If you go to uh, Asia and uh, Pacific is 19 point time, but Malaysia it's actually it was it was good. It was about about the 20% at one point in 1980. It went down. That's not good. Having higher taxes is not good. Having higher taxes is good. Sorry, I've heard you say that a thousand times, and this is my first opportunity. Can I share my experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I hate tax, who doesn't want to love tax here? <laughs> but I love Canada. I mean, uh, lived in Canada because my daughter, when she was born, was born prematurely. They didn't cut corners. She had the best health care. And it's called health insurance, but it's not insurance. It's tax. I used to curse the government that they take one third of my income or more for tax. After that, I said, God bless Canada. You know, this is really the country that I have my. But again, I mean, this is a. Uh, wanted to say again, I don't agree with all taxes, uh, just to make my question clear. Income tax, I think it's already uh, worth average in Malaysia, and especially if you add uh, a contribution to EPF. Where I see the problem, I mean, is my view is related to uh, the indirect tax. Uh, uh, as you see, like, uh, world average is about 10%, in Malaysia it's 3%, the indirect tax. Right? So, Technically, you can come back to the idea of GST when it was introduced. We call it, uh, I prefer value add tax is better than. Each 1% of value add tax would generate about 11 billion ringgit. It's, it's double, but more a triple actually what you can generate from that in that direct tax. And to make it popular, I think you just be lucky then for healthcare. Just dedicate it 6%. For, uh, for healthcare. I mean, it's again that we can uh, think about also other, other models. And if you bring the six pack, which was in Malaysia, it's still way below the global average. Global average of GST or value at tax, 17%. Right? 17% is global average, so 6% is still way below. It will, it will be regressive, so we need to introduce healthcare because healthcare uh, 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 it's more progressive benefit, but also you might want to introduce also cash uh, uh, assistance for families with children and other things. So 6%, I mean, it, it will generate about 66 billion ringgit. <coughs> if we shoot for world average, I mean, way, way, just, just like this hypothetical, it can increase that amount of money. Uh, with that, I finish. Huh? We don't want to explain team, but just like hypothetical, I use all hypothetical. That's not that sales and service tax, though. Not six. No, the value add tax. Yeah, I know that, but that six percent is the SST, right? That you're 
I if you introduce value of tax at 6%, uh, SST, I mean, the tax at small. I mean, that's a different discussion, but just like hypothetically, if you introduce that. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm glad that you've now brought in another dimension in terms of where you find money from getting it from some of the subsidies that are really not supposed to be there, uh, maybe. Uh, and secondly, from indirect tax. So this is a uh, really, uh, which I'm sure they have comments. And <laughs> sure they All right, so the final discussion uh, is Lynn. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, before I start my presentation, just a bit of disclaimer. Yeah. Even though I have used EPF template for this, what I speak is of my personal views and not representing EPF. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> invitation is sent to my invitation. <laughs> so I'm using my uh, the template, but uh, what I speak of is more of my personal views. So uh, again, just send statistics, but presented in a different way. This is just a graphic representation of uh, when we talk about how financing is so our main objective is actually financial risk protection. So we want to protect our citizens from uh, what we call catastrophic or impoverishing uh, health expenditure. So the definition of catastrophic health expenditure varies, but usually uh, the one is used for SDG 3.8 for universal coverage. If you look at 3.8 for 3, 2, that's for financial risk protection. We're looking at uh, percentage of uh, uh, populations with household, household expenditure. Health expenditure has more than 10% of their household budget. So with that, and we realize that's uh, actually plotted on x axis. And then I also spotted median line for you know the hundred plus close to two hundred uh, countries that have data. Then we have on the white axis here a uh, population that's pushed below uh, the native poverty line. So that's actually the definition <coughs> of population expenditure. If you look at the distribution you know, globally, you see Malaysia you see is on the lower left end. So we are actually better than most countries here. Uh, we have quite successful, I think, in productive, you know, especially the uh, ability of the health system. Uh, how we came about it is actually you known from uh, how the past, you know, the government has uh, invested in uh, establishing health facilities in the rural uh, areas because that, that, those are the places where uh, the market will not actually uh, uh, be benefiting the product, uh, product as much. And as we have also established through the work on uh, medical and healthcare, so as like an establishing network of public facilities in rural areas. And they have midwives, medical assistants, even though they, they, most of them were not staffed with doctors like that. But we have medical assistants, we have midwives that actually do home visits, you know, making sure that pregnant mothers are taken care of, making sure that the uh, LGBTU will work better. So we see a drop, you know, massive drop in terms of maternal uh, and child mortality ratio. So that's where we are. In fact, we achieve uh, universal health care. I mean, if you talk about UNC coverage, right? Uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, added uh, when our average uh, GDP, or oh, sorry, every uh, per capita income was at 3,700. That's annual income, uh, that's international dollars. So if you look at Japan, Japan achieved it that they, their income was at 9,700. Uh, Sweden, 8,700. So we actually made quite <coughs> remarkable achievement, you know, at much lower income. So that's, we have a really, I would say, quite quite good public uh, health uh, framework there, our mission is there. Um, so next we look at the next slide. So uh, again here we are looking at the perfect structure for the we have seen some we are looking at you know, the global uh, where we are among the global uh, countries. So here uh, if you look at the health strategy as a percentage of GDP, we are below the median. We are actually among the lowest when it comes to uh, upper middle income and high income countries. Yeah, so even we exclude the high income countries, we are actually among the lowest uh, in the upper upper middle income group. If we look at all uh, out of pocket expenditure as a percentage of uh, health expenditure, again, we are all above the global median, uh, among the highest uh, in, when it comes to only the income countries. So now we look at, you know, we talk about government health expenditure, right? That's how we was the uh, health expenditure. So government health expenditure is about 2%, uh, again, below global median. If you look at the government health expenditure as a percentage of uh, total government uh, expenditure, again, we are actually below global median. Right. So this is just, just a predicted uh, kind of uh, health spending. So back in 2019, again, this is actually adjusted. Uh, so this is inflation adjusted uh, to 2021 US dollars for just for comparison. So there's a study done by Chang and Ho. So uh, in, in 2019, it was about 52%, uh, that's $247 per capita. 
uh, have the test of house spending. So if you look at the projected figures for 2050, uh, government house spending will actually increase more than double, so to about $569 uh, <coughs> per person. And if you see the, the distributions, right, that's actually a big shift. So for, uh, that would be actually that's an expected increase in uh, prepaid private spending. Uh, the out-of-pocket spending will reduce, but in total, that will be, it will double in about 30 years time. So now we look at you know why there's an increase in expenditure. So this was some analysis I uh, I did you know, a couple of years ago uh, using some uh, global disease of urban, uh, urban disease uh, study and also the UN World Population Perspective. So this is actually just comparing disease burden between 20, 2007 and 2017. So it's a 10 year kind of change. Uh, so we look at each of the categories that is commonly used in GDP. So now we have different categories of uh, causes of disease. The what percentage of those changes in disease burden is coming from population growth, so just increase in population uh, numbers, then what percentage of that is coming from population aging, <coughs> and what percentage is actually due to change in the prevalence or disease uh, rate. So if you look at that overall, if the top uh, chart there is actually showing all causes combined, so we see that the effect of population growth and population aging now, during the 10-year period from 2007 to 2017, it's about the same. And if let's say there's no improvement in disease program, so this is actually a function of both, uh, it could be increase in burden or decrease in burden, and also then uh, uh, the functions of uh, improvement in medical treatment. So advanced in technology will actually bring it down, but then if let's say disease burden increase at a faster uh, rate, then the rate that's brought down by medical advancement, you will see that in certain category of disease, the burden uh, the, of the disease should increase. Yeah. So if you minus all that, then we see that actually the, the, the effect of population growth, aging, and the uh, cost specific uh, daily rate, so that's the disease burden rate, is actually different depending on the degree. So if you look, if you plot this uh, chart further back, right, you see it's very different because uh, the infectious disease rate is uh, coming down, and at a point of time, we have not faced the uh, double whammy of population. Uh, uh, demographic transition and also the increase in the non communicable disease burden. But now, if you can see over time, and uh, you can see that for, for example, for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease, because of increase in burden, even though there's advanced medical technology, the burden will actually increase, uh, coupled with population growth, which is that will actually push uh, the graph further to the right. So there will be increase in burden, increase in economic burden, both disease and economic burden. So that's actually back then. So here, um, just an overview of the public health funding system in Malaysia. So I've actually omitted the private side right, because we were, I mean, the, top, the topic of the round tables on uh, financing public health. So here, this is actually a simplified version. So basically, in Malaysia, uh, the citizens and the primary residents pay the general taxes, and then from other, combined with uh, the other government revenues, going to consolidate the fund, and then the Ministry of Finance, and then Ministry of Finance then can pick uh, budget to measure health, and then that's actually uh, drawn down to the price of public facilities, either the hospitals or the clinic, based on the life budget factors. Uh, and then um, we have also some uh, supplementary programs by the measure health, so we have Tabong Kwan Puan Pro Wadan. This is actually a financial aid to the underprivileged. So not everything under the government is actually covered. In fact, as presented by uh, Dr. Asun just now, we, we do see that the developmental expenditure has stayed. No, really, relatively stable about the same over the years. So that actually means that the increase in cost, right? You know, med medicines are getting more and more expensive. The list of medications covered by government actually been reduced, becoming shorter and shorter. Right. So for some of those uh, medical care that's not covered by uh, the government, um, for those unprivileged, they can actually apply for this double private provider. Okay, you know, medical social workers will actually visit the house, see if they are eligible and all. But the administrative cost of this is actually quite high, and uh, often time patients actually pass it before they, their application got approved. So then we have backup for this. So backup for this was actually you know kind of like I was part of this whole project. Yeah. So um, you know when, during the last elections, I mean in twenty eighteen, uh, the husband at that time husband had manifesto. Not what the top ten manifesto was actually to expand the for the visa hard slang more program uh, nationwide. So then, but you know, that to the VC Hearts was actually focusing on uh, subsidizing acute care. Uh, if you analyze data, there's quite a lot of front cases by the medical doctors. Say, for example, each family they get 500 ringgit a year. So you see, towards the end of the year, for the finish, you will see a lot of description of false supplements or unnecessary health screening. 
So that's how actually the funds was used and all. And we also felt that government should not actually subsidize the acute care. Uh, because acute care is actually quite quite affordable. It's something that you know, uh, uh, most paid people should be able to deal with. It is actually in chronic care that needs uh, kind of the sub subsidizing. So that was some motivation, the scheme, and it came out with some medical aid. <coughs> like, so generally, there was a house screening of one of the to, you know, to encourage the detection of those undiagnosed uh, diabetes, hypertension, like uh, hypercholesterolemia. There was also incentive for people to actually, for example, cancer patients or those with follow up, you know, pull out uh, visits for surgeries uh, and, uh, and the like to go to the hospital. So they get uh, incentive, transport incentive that can calculate them based on the distance of their home, hospital, so on and so forth. So that was actually for the uh, at the time, it was called BSH, so Green basically called BSH, and now it's called SDR. So those who are under the scheme, they will actually be automatically, as long as your name is actually in the database, there's actually no further check. So we do not actually send it to the workers at all. So approval is fast and actually quite a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, default yeah, that's under the SDR database benefit from this. So there's some form of this actually goes to the private uh, providers because the health screening can also be done by uh, the. Uh, private product for others. Um, and, and then there's some components of pocket spending because as I mentioned just now, not everything, uh, not all the services and medications are covered when you go to the government hospital. So some of that you still have paid uh, out of pocket. But otherwise then we have also some people you know like well, we have social and we also have people withdrawing from EPF savings for medical purposes. We have private health insurance we have uh, mostly provided by employers and then we have the our pocket spending. So that is actually, you know, it, it, it in itself show how uh, it, the cost of business is actually from this condition. So I have actually uh, put this into three pillars of the collection of funds, pooling of funds, and purchasing of service, and the provision of services. And you can see here, Ministry of Health is acting as purchaser, provider, register, and policy maker. Right. This is something that is not usually seen in other countries. So that, that's why actually, in the, I, I believe in the White House reform white paper that's actually proposed to change it. And I just want to put forward two case study of how you know some other one two other example uh, Asian countries have done it. So first is actually Republic of Korea. So we know uh, Korea is one of the OECD countries. In fact, their health outcomes are actually quite good. With most of them is actually above the OECD area. So let's see you know how uh, uh, health financing is like in, in Korea. So in Korea, the majority of the funds they have the national health insurance. And about 86% of that is coming from contributions from employers, employees, you know, uh, and uh, self-employed workers. So they contribute uh, based on the rates that's uh, coming from them to the national health insurance. And then they also have, uh, now under the national health insurance corporations that manage the MHI, they have a medical aid program here that is for the uh, underprivileged or people with low income, the low income households. And then recently, aging, not, not that recently, in 2008, they ended this long-term care insurance because of aging. So they have actually ended by uh, insurance for, for long-term care. And uh, on top of that, there's actually subsidies. Right? That, that's coming from uh, the, both the general taxes that can be actually coming from the central government or the local governments, they actually subsidize. And most of them, the local governments actually, the subsidies from local governments go to the Medicaid program, uh, not for low income households in their area at all. And then they also have earmarked some portions of their tobacco taxes that will actually go into these uh, national health insurance fund as subsidies. So the National Health Insurance Fund is actually managed, you know, enrollment of beneficiary, uh, collections of premiums, and also paid out to providers. Whereas the claims review, review scheme <coughs> approval and all is actually done by an independent agency that's called Health Insurance Review and uh, Assessment Services, called HERA. So they actually will actually decide, you know, the dependency package and all. So if you look at that, the payment to the hospitals uh, is actually a combination of both people service, meaning the more service to provide, you actually get more. That actually is some, some form of treatment that, is some form of payment that incentivizes providers to actually pro provide unnecessary care. But on top of that, they have DRG, so basically DRG is kind of like a group of uh, uh, diagnosis and payment space on the type diagnosis, the severity of the disease. So then we have, they also have reimbursement to the uh, 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 clinics. So for clinics, it's mostly on the uh, service. And on top of that, you know, for those that are not covered in core payments, they do have some, some form of core payments to control because you know, we do know that uh, insurance is usually uh, subjected to the moral hazard, so people will use it as if, if everything is covered, you tend to use it even though you don't need to. So there's an elements of co payment to limit. You know, if let's say you have to pay 
a certain amount, a certain percentage of core insurance, right? Then you will be actually, you know, like, so do I really need to go for this care if I have to pay thirty dollars out of that hundred dollar bills, things like that. So this is for Korea. So Korea actually started their health financing reform back in seventy seven. So in in sixty three, uh, they started to have more health insurance. So this is basically. Uh, private health insurance, but 77, that's when they started, you know, but they did, the coverage expansion is actually very good. So they started with firms, large firms with more than 500 employees, then after two years, they expanded it to civil servants, to uh, private school teachers, then after that, they, uh, they expanded it to the uh, self-employed. Firstly, self-employed in the rural areas, then self-employed in the urban areas. That's when they uh, reach 100% coverage. So Korea 100 percent coverage is that 1989. Over 12 years, they managed to expand coverage from 60 percent to 100 percent. And then after that, over the, the many decades, right, they improved their package, they improved their administration. So administration as here is actually very efficient in the sense that of all the premiums collected, 95 percent go to pay out to claims, and then only the, the administrative cost is only 5 percent. And with that, right, if over the years, you know, they, they do have surplus, whenever they have surplus, they will have to improve their benefit package, and then they'll see what, what they can cover for. So this is what, how Korea is doing it. Taiwan is actually more simpler. So Taiwan, you can see even the chest is simpler. So Taiwan is about the same. So Taiwan pollutions come from, it's actually a tripartite. So employers, individuals, and uh, also taxes for, from the government uh, is about equal proportions, about equal proportions for you to get national health insurance. And then they do have contribution subsidies. Again, they have a tobacco and a Texas earmark for health. And they also have taxes on lottery grants. This also go in to the Asian health issues as contribution subsidies. Uh, then they do have regional office, you know, for each of the regions, six regions, uh, that will actually make payment to the hospital, the clinics, similar to Korea system, fee for service on the IV for hospital, fee for service for the uh, uh, private clinics. And actually, this is quite different from Korea because Korea has, like, it's quite equivalent proportions of public and private providers. For instance, in Taiwan, it's actually mostly private providers. They have only very, very limited public hospitals. Almost all of their primary clinics are private uh, clinics, but they are all contracted under this one single area, national health insurance. Or uh, then they do have call payments and concerns to actually control. So, yeah, so you know, for private clinic, usually you do have to uh, call pay a certain fixed amount, and then for hospital, it's mostly call insurance, so you pay a certain percentage. And the contribution subsidies is mostly to cover those who are uh, underprivileged or low income households, either in terms of helping them to pay their premium or in terms of helping them pay, to pay for the cost payments of pensions if they can afford to. So, this is uh, private interest. I will did this in a few years. Okay, Very different political and you know, economic environment compared to, uh, to Korea. So, back in, you know, in, in the 1990s, so right after the uh, fall of Chang families. So the president he came on board and you know he has huge support and the economy was booming in China, in Taiwan. So they were able to in one go do a kind of big bang reform. They pro when they first started with this innovation from the US, they were able to provide very kind of I would say that serious for a starting point, right? Uh, quite a serious kind of benefit coverage because they wanted to include the civil servants in the system from the beginning. So their package was here. No worst of that citizen. I mean, we do know that you reach a sum of uh, the, the health benefits for uh, citizens are quite generous. So they started with very good because they, the, the environment actually enabled that. So they were able to do a kind of big bang. Over time, you know, because with that, they were kind of like, they achieved units average, running from 60% to 100% in just less than a few years, about two years, three years time. And over the years, you now from, that was done in 1995, so it's about 30 years now, that's increased premium three times because that was a deficit because of Asian economic crisis and all, that's increased the premium three times. But at the moment, it's still rather affordable. Yeah. So I'll maybe stop that, but before I go there, so I want to, so, I mean, I would like to argue that it's not zero sum here, but whether it's enough funding from the general tax revenue or funding from contributions, it can be a combination of both, both of both. We could start with you no know, high proportion coming from tax. Because if you look at this, just showing statistics from PPF data, most of the, even we are looking at former workers, most of them earn very low wages, 38% earn below, below 2001. So if, let's say, you take, what, take an additional contribution to go into this uh, national health insurance or social health insurance, whatever you call it, and now the take home pay will be, you know, not something that is actually uh, uh, well liked by the public. And so, but in the future, if let's say we do manage to 
have policies that help improve their wages and all of that. You know, that, that portions can come, they, 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 when they are able to contribute, to, to contribute, the portions that come in from general tax can be actually more focused on helping the low income, the underprivileged, you know, subsidizing them, whereas those who can afford, you know, they can actually be. And we can do a progressive structure like Korea. So Korea, the contribution to the national health insurance is actually based on income, the higher the income, the more you pay to the national health insurance. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you know, this, this last bit goes into how you want to make the changes by looking at two cases. I'm assuming you find both these two cases as good examples of health uh, yeah, right. care uh, the system. Mix, you know, of tax uh, finance and uh, yeah. contribution to finance. Okay, so thank you very much. We've heard from the presenters and discussants and let's open it. We have uh, about 20 minutes for uh, some discussion and then we need to add. I see one, I see two, I see, okay, you'll be the third. There's nobody else. You just go in the morning, right? Okay, so yes, please, just, yeah. Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, good evening to everyone. So uh, my name is Dr. Mokai. So. Then me, I'm a postgraduate student in public health, so yes, my question is more in line in regards to the public health side. So um, actually, it's interesting discussion whether SHI or pavilion based health care model is actually more beneficial between each other and agreeable in terms of how that the how does the money being spent is another issue. But my question at this point of time is. Regardless whether is it a social health insurance or revenue-based health insurance, one of the things that I notice while I'm working in the Ministry of Health, especially in terms of with regards to policy and the social behaviour of the population, is that the Malaysian population is actually, I would say, perceived with regards to health care delivery services as something that is accessible and without much cost. So by that, right, it somehow or another led them in terms of the social behavioral itself that they are taking less care of their health. So my question here is uh, to the speakers and to the panelists is regardless of whichever model it is, right, how does either of these models or any form of models actually helps to incentivize our Malaysian population to actually taking care of themselves. Because I think that's important. Why is it so? We talk about, for example, we can have a look into all the charts, all the data, saying that we spend quite a number, a significant numbers in terms of preventive care. But the question here is, how does the preventive care is actually measured? Do we actually see the return of value or the ROI return of investment in terms of the preventive care amount that we spend, regardless whether it's public spending or the private spending? And I think with that, just one question is of enough interest for the time being. I have a lot more questions, but I'll reserve it for now. Right. Thank you. After the tea. Yes. <laughs> Second question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard, a uh, postgraduate student from the University of Malaya. So uh, actually I have one comment and two points for discussion. So the comment uh, firstly is about the healthcare expenditure, the 5% of GDP. Leaving aside the rationale and how we come to that 5% of GDP. But in my opinion, we need actually more than that 5%. Yeah. Because the 5% is only enough for us to manage the current health crisis. But if we, because we can't leave behind those people who are currently on dialysis, heart failure, and need regular follow-ups. So that 5% is only to manage those population. But we need more than that because we need to also fund health promotion and also to get more public health uh, professionals in the all uh, policy decision making. Not only in healthcare, but also in food industry, in foreign worker dormitories, because all this will contribute and health ministry of health is going to be the tail end of this continuum because if you don't manage these infectious diseases, non communicable diseases, in the end, no matter how much money you pump into the health uh, ministry of health or into the health sector, there will be more tsunami of health crisis coming. 
So we have to stop that. So the thing is, we need to tell the politicians and policy makers that we need to spend more before in the years to come that we manage to cut down on the health care expenditure where the future younger generations are getting healthier, aging healthier, then perhaps at time we could shrink down our expenditure. So we need to spend more before we can spend less. That, that's my comment. And about my points for discussion, uh, I have attended quite a number of uh, health financing debate court forums and we're always talking about the dichotomy of tax funded or, or SH, uh, national health insurance. But I'm thinking, actually, do we actually just want features of both uh, tax funded and SHI? It's not actually just one or another. So perhaps what we want is actually still using taxation base, because there's no point creating another SHI or national health insurance where we are still collecting health taxes, but we're creating another parallel system on top of our income tax. So why don't we just ask the government to collect more revenues? Because as uh, we mentioned, the tax to GDP ratio in Malaysia is still quite low. So there's still room for perhaps a GSP or some other ways that we could perhaps tackle the great economy, uh, which, for example, the e-invoicing is doing now. So there's still room for more tax funded. So maybe that's what we want. And also, we want some features of NHI, SHI, for example, strategic purchaser or a separate pool that we can have a more predictable source of health funding. So perhaps these features of this both that we want rather than one or another, that is what I've come to conclusion after attended quite a number of health financing uh, debates. And another, the second part of discussion I want to throw out is about the idea of having a medical savings account. Yeah, I know in Singapore they have the MediSafe, and what my colleague here was mentioning about how we want to inculcate the personal individual responsibility to take care of our own health. Because when we are having the current healthcare system that we have, where people can just freely access health care, then it takes away the incentive for people to really take care of their health. Uh, because if you're, if you're a smoker, you're a mark if when you come into injury, the public hospital have to treat you regardless. So perhaps, what about the idea of medical savings, where not necessary that the depositor or the individuals have to put in money by themselves, but rather, since the government already subsidized the public health care system, why not we have a targeted subsidy where the government perhaps will deposit directly into the B40, the M40, but people, when they utilize the health care system, they have to make certain amount of co payment from that medical savings account. So rather than directly subsidizing the hospital, make the people pay by themselves. And they see in their medical savings account, it's getting lesser if they don't take care of them. So I'm thinking perhaps that might be a better psychological impact on those individuals to take care of their health uh, when they see it's their own medical savings account, rather than it's just subsidy that always from the government, I don't care, it's not none of my business. Yeah, just this so your last point answers his, his question. <laughs> okay, Adam. Quickly, please. Very, very quickly. Yes, thank you. Uh, Adam Mahmoud, uh, AD economics student. Uh, firstly, uh, with regards to the uh, issue of uh, out of pocket spending, when you compare Malaysia, Thailand, and uh, uh, Turkey with regards to the white paper, being it's having that 4%. So, uh, from my own uh, point of view, I was thinking maybe. Uh, Malaysia is not able to attract global talent in terms of uh, doctors. That is why there is much more to spend for out-of-pocket uh, payment because uh, the middle-class uh, Malaysians would prefer to pay more in order to be in a queue in a normal public hospital. I was thinking if uh, Malaysia was able to attract more global talent in, in terms of doctors uh, with different specialties, this can be subsided. <coughs> of course, uh, in the white paper, there are so much to do with the out of uh, pocket payment uh, with regards to pulling or bringing in more money together in order to subside that, that sector. Being as it may, other innovative finances that uh, I see around other countries that are adopting, be it public-private partnership, uh, uh, tax on the many goods, remittance from people abroad, and of course, uh, 
uh, sovereign wealth fund that is usually used to to enhance or to finance a healthcare system. And of course, I don't know whether Malaysia is taking into cognizance the issue of this uh, Islamic financing. Is it that it's not taking, because in all the presentation, uh, the data is just showing normal uh, healthcare expenditure, conventional. Well, we didn't see any, form, maybe Zakat, Sadaqat, or Kaf in terms of financing healthcare. And of, and of course, I can see Malaysia is doing well because if you project the data, maybe maybe from 2000 to date, the healthcare expenditure is current healthcare expenditure is uh, going up, and uh, out of pocket spending has been drastically going down. Uh, talk less of uh, the issue of uh, private health care system too. The expenditure has been going down. And the last three uh, is the issue of public health, which has been going on. So I will I will say based on this, the white paper is in conformity with the uh, universal best practices. But the only thing is we are always looking at how we can get more funds in order to finance this health care delivery system. And this innovative ways public uh, public private partnership the very good just like uh Dr. was talking about indirect taxes this starts on the very good like tobacco like alcohol and the likes it can be channeled in this uh, in this sense thank you can I very very quick one okay thank you for highlighting uh for the public private I'm Shahul from public private private partnership unit from the Prime Minister Department Thank you for highlighting that PPP is very important and we have done many projects and other PPP uh, initiative. Okay, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, a lot of uh, hospitals and a lot of the uh, clinics and as well we also uh, in the way of uh, one project we, 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 we uh, do it under PPP uh, initiative. Uh, another comment is about the 15% of increments of the development expenditure. I think it's not possible. Because one thing we have a very constrained budget, that's why we push to PPP initiative. Another thing is uh, we have discussed, uh, Mr. Hui means to discuss about the I, I like it the the, the, the framework uh, or the the framework that you, you showcase about the Taiwan's model and the current model, the contribution from employee and employees uh, to 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 the national insurance scheme is very good. Then we need to set up another cooperation like the EPF instead of uh, contribute to the EPF, we also need to contribute to another cooperation. That is very good suggestion. And then I think that to discuss about the uh, other also discuss the national health uh, insurance. So many things because I, I think that this, this, this initiative has been discussed in the MOH a lot of times. So, but the question is now is the political will. There is no political will here. Because I'm from MOF, we see a lot of budget, budget, uh, I mean to, to I mean to uh, put it under MOH, put it under uh, MOE. But um, unfortunately, when we discuss it, when we want to table to the cabinet, unfortunately, the the, the paper, the cabinet paper was put up one thing is a political way. That's why we, we can discuss it about it. But unfortunately, here. I hear three guys here, three one uh, this from MOH. I think that uh, they are young yeah, students. So I hope both of you or three of you uh, can convey it to your minister. I, I I'm also I'm from government servant. I, I know the, the 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 I mean the what what happened in the in government. So that is my comments. There are no cases. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Now. Uh to respond. I, I, th I think because there are quite a number of comments, I leave it to everyone of the speakers and discussants to, to choose what you would like to comment on, one or two. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for, for allowing me to just speak first because I've got to go and catch up on the meeting. Um, very firstly, uh, we have to remember that the framework of public financing that we have today is based on the early 1980s models that we have, when disease burden was very different. Uh, the kind of profile cases, the amount that we're spending on healthcare, the state of health of the Malaysian population was very different. 
Today we have an NCD crisis, we have to respond to that crisis, plus the aging concern and so forth. Um, you know, uh, it was interesting for me to hear the 10% the, the of household income expenditure. For us, uh, we use 30% uh, as the, yeah, so 30% of household expenditure, we consider it catastrophic uh, expenditure, and for uh, things like uh, health spending for cancer and so forth, we use 30%. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to just mention here is that out-of-pocket spending today is 40% of health uh, expenditure, and it's increasing. And this is coming up from people's savings, people's, uh, you know, they are having to, to mortgage their house, they have to do different things to be able to afford the kind of care that they should be able to get under a universal scheme, and we're not uh, being able to do that. There's a lot that I can respond to concerning subsidies. I mean, seriously, I'm one of those who believes that we shouldn't have fuel subsidies. I don't own a car, so maybe I have an interest in that. I don't drive, really. I take public transport. You know? But I see people, when it comes to fuel subsidies, six, I think it's, I think it's uh, 60 billion uh, that we're spending, oh no, sorry, 50 something billion on uh, fuel subsidies, which is 70% of total subsidies. So definitely, if we got rid of the fuel subsidies, we we'll definitely be able to get some savings there, but seriously, the Prime Minister is trying to get like, diesel subsidies right now, and right now, if I'm not mistaken, the plan is to gradually get rid of fuel subsidies or target those subsidies for uh, income households, sorry, lower income households, but even then, it's going to be a slog. And the plan is to definitely give cash transfers to uh, you know households that need the money. I think that the amount is around 350 ringgit per month that they're thinking about right now. So we're going to see the, these announcements come up very soon. I wanted to mention here, and this is very important because uh, it can be very theoretical for us here in, in this room, but the fact is, is that a lot of decisions concerning treatment and care today in public healthcare is being made on the basis of budget. What is available in today's uh, 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 what the uh, doctor can talk to you about in terms of your care is dependent on how much budget that they have to spend. Because budgets now are linked to things like hospital. Do, do they have enough budget to pay for that medication that you need? So today, when they talk to you about your, your care, they're not necessarily thinking of what you need, but what can we afford? So treatment decisions are being made based on budget. We need that to not happen. We need that to change. And we need to change the conversation concerning uh, the treatment because I give you examples: breast cancer uh, in. Sorry, I just have to catch this. Hello. Yeah, I'll join you in a bit. Okay. Got it. So the the problem here is I give you an example concerning breast cancer. Malaysia is among the worst countries in the world. Sorry, in Asia, when it comes to breast cancer, five years survival rate. Women are dying of breast cancer higher in Malaysia. The mortality is higher in Malaysia compared to countries like Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines. And the reason why is the availability of innovative treatments that should be made available for women who have breast cancer. So we need to make sure that we're able to look for Yeah. So a lot of them are coming late presentation, which is stage three and four. But in our, those countries also, where they have late presentation, the drugs are available for stage 3 and 4. Breast cancer is available. Of course, if you come earlier, you have more options. But the fact is, is that are you going to say to women with breast cancer that, I'm sorry, you came in late, in stage 3 or 4, we have no drugs for you? Is that going to be our answer? No. We want to make sure they get the care that they need. So what I'm saying here, and I think I just wanted to just uh, uh, perhaps end here with my uh, my intervention, and I'll join in after I'm done with my call shortly. Is I like what that gentleman for MOH said just now about investing in preventative health. Preventative health is basically what we want to be able to move towards. Right now it's sick care, right? We need to move towards where we're looking at healthcare, where we're looking at holistically, but most importantly, not treat them at the most expensive point of care, which is treating them with disease. Because the symptoms so we want them to be prevented. But I tell you this, preventive health is not sexy. You can get, cannot get the results. You you put in the kind of money, you put like, say, 200 million, preventive health, you talk about education, talking about health literacy, 
Where's the result? Where are you going to get the result? The results may be a decade down the road before you see fewer cases. But you have to invest in order to get the results. But we don't. Health literacy in Malaysia is a third of the population are health illiterate. Meaning, when you say it's health illiterate, meaning they don't understand the information, they don't know uh, what is being conveyed to them, uh, in terms of how it relates to them, and most importantly, they do not understand how they should use the information to change their behavior. That is very important. You don't automatically give information to get results. So, uh, I just wanted to toss it out there, and I'll join you back again after my call, uh, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I will spare Azlo from my criticisms when it comes back. But I, I think uh, that allow me to, to, to highlight two or three points which Professor Williams made. The first point I think is a very important point, that there's no way you're going to be serious about either universal health care or about health for all, which are the two slogans which Malaysia is committed to without a tax, a revenue finance uh, arrangement. Secondly, I think the other observation he made, which almost in passing, but I think is so important, is that oftentimes you hear the word insurance when actually you're referring to revenue financing. And I'm specifically referring to not only the case of, of the UK, uh, which, which uh, he's very familiar with, but also the case of Canada, for instance. And there are many other instances where you often hear the word insurance, but actually what it refers to is a revenue-based uh, arrangement. And because there is this recognition of the cost of insurance, the unnecessary avoidable cost of insurance, and the perverse incentives which are introduced, I have a very, I had a very uh, frustrating experience recently, which fortunately didn't jeopardize my health more seriously because of the nature of my problem. But I can imagine easily how so many people would have suffered much more in a similar situation if not for, if, if they had much more uh, life-threatening instances. So I think we have to think through these, these issues very seriously. Now just to highlight, so that when he comes back we can, we can discuss this issue, in Azul's presentation as well as in his response to the questions uh, there was really very little discussion of, of actual financing. He's, he, he said very explicitly he's committed to social health insurance. He does not address the problems which I raised, neither did he address the problems which Professor Williams raised. So I think it's very important for us to recognize that the SHI case is not founded on any kind of sound economics. And I'm, here I'm referring to very conventional economics. Okay? I'm not referring to some kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, there, uh, there, is a, there is a new play on in the West End called NYE. NYE, N-Y-E. It refers to NYE Brevin, and Nurim Brevin, who founded the National Health. I mean, where else in the, you know, you, you just imagine, a person who initiated the National Health Service in the UK is now lionized as one of the heroes of post-war UK culture. I think, I think it just it says a lot about the significance. Most people have never heard of him. We don't normally think about him, but I think it's very important and very telling that he is, he is a, for, for people who are committed to him. There is a very, uh, you know, there's a very strong commitment to this. Now, um, I can understand uh, Professor Williams' trepidation about taxing, and I think it has become uh, the norm, especially in OECD economies, uh, for tax to go up. In the way which Professor uh, Dr. Amjad Rabi uh, highlighted that normally it comes to a uh, more significant share of of income uh, goes to. And then we have, of course, the counter-revolution against taxation, led by people like Arthur Laffer, uh, about four and a half decades ago, adopt, adopted and popularized by 
uh, Ronald Reagan, and subsequently also uh, uh, by more recently by uh, Donald Trump. Now, I think it's very important to recognize that the British situation, uh, sorry, the American situation is not an, something which anybody else can emulate, can emulate, because you have a situation where the, de the deficit has been financed since 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 uh, since uh, in the post-war period, but especially in the period uh, since the 1980s, the taxes have gone down, but the Americans have not had to pay for the other because the rest of the world is quite happy to finance American deficits by buying up treasury bonds. Okay, we have a very perverse system, but as Charles de Gaulle and, 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 and uh, uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing said in the 1960s, this is an exorbitant privilege, the privilege of being the superpower in the world, which has implications for the monetary system. I think nobody else can think about the world that way. Okay? And I think we have to be have to be disciplined. So you have those who might want to tax more and to tax less. But I think most people in Malaysia looking at the tax system are quite aware that you know as, as the late Professor Ismail Salim correctly pointed out, Malaysia has had a, a regressive tax system overall for a whole variety of reasons. And the progressive component of the direct taxation on income taxes uh, has basically uh, declined significantly, especially with the reforms from 1984, okay, when, when uh, introduced uh, uh, his first budget. So what I've seen right now is we have a fiscal system which is fundamentally regressive. And we have a lot of inefficiencies in the system, collecting revenues and so on. Let me allow me to just make one, one comment, which we should not see directly relevant. But we have a system in this country where student loans are financed by something called PTPT. Now, Joe Biden can be elected as we write off the same in Malaysia, what we have seen is a leader of ideas who used to work at the Conservative Party headquarters. He has basically created a completely unnecessary bureaucracy within PTN, PTN because as he confessed to me privately, it's, you know, it's politics. He needs, to, he needs to develop a system of patronage which he presides over to advance his career in politics. Now, we have a lot of perverse incentives. And so we cannot understand all the perverse incentives in Malaysia without understanding what Professor Williams referred to as being a okay. So we have a lot of things. So I think Dr. Lim pointed correctly pointed out a few things which I think are worth underscoring. She pointed out that we have very low infant mortality and uh, uh, we had lower infant mortality and infant and maternal mortality. These were the consequence of very, very simple reforms and low cost reforms introduced from the 1960s. In the 1960s, uh, the wife of the doctor, that was uh, Francis Mohamed Said, who was a contributor, became contributor of the seminar. He was a doctor in practice. His wife was a trained midwife, and she introduced a system of uh, what are called bidan kampo. So the bidan kampo basically meant the availability of midwife, wife uh, supported. Uh, births, uh, sorry, pregnancies and births. And the result of it, over time, has been that this alone, this simple reduction in infant and maternal mortality alone is responsible for arguably about 80% of the increase in life expectancy. Okay. Now, much more could be done, as we have tried to argue in a different context, 
by improving, for example, nutritional support uh, in, in, in early stage. Okay? The first thousand days for those of you who are familiar with this and so on. So what I think what I think you're 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 really pointing to is the crucial significance of these types of reforms. But if you do not have those reforms to begin with, okay, or the reforms come about through other means, which is the case in Korea and, and Taiwan, the hybrid system is not really going to work. Okay? It just means that you have some public financing. And I think it's very important to recognize that you still have a lot of exclusion or from, from, from in, in both that. Now, I'm not saying that they have not made significant improvements in efficiencies, but part of the reason is because you have a single, single, uh, yeah, yeah, single purchase. And this is very important because we have had a very perverse system where the most profitable parts of the healthcare system were privatized. And this is why I think that our friends who are promoting PPPs should take a lot of attention, pay a lot of attention to this. Because you create PPPs, okay, and you privatize the most lucrative parts of the system, including getting rid of toxic waste uh, in the medical system. You know? um, and you do all this, and at the, at the same time, you underfund whatever is left. Okay? So, the, so you, you're not really... You know, we complain about paying the, the doctors and the nurses and whatnot, when in fact a great, great deal of money is siphoned off to pay for this, for this uh, uh, other services which need not go to be place. So we, in a sense, have have uh, seen the evolution of a hybrid system with a hybridity not rational by any means. So we have. In a sense, the, uh, the, the, the worst of, of, of many, many. The other point I would like to emphasize is that we, we should not be, you know, for some uh, dogmatic reason, be married to a 4% or 5%. 4% was the proposal from the PH before the 2018 election. Tun when he became prime minister, said, said Oh, that, that was not done with this approval, and it just basically went to the blocks. And then in the in the last election, 2022, they came up with this high, this system of incorporating and generalizing the, the slum system, which I think Dr. Lim has correctly pointed out. This has there's so many flaws with it that it's not a, a desirable system. So we cannot allow, and this is why. It's a, uh, uh, I was hoping you'd come back soon. But, okay, but I think we, we cannot allow the insurance industry to lobby for reforms. And, and other others with other powerful including pharmaceutical interests, for example. You know? And one of the things which was successfully achieved by Dr. Uh, Dr. Subramanian, who was the health minister before, was that he, he negotiated a drug for hepatitis C. There are about half a million people in this country who have suffered from hepatitis C. We pretend that the foreigners don't, 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 don't exist in this country. So half a million Malaysians out of the 34 or so. Now, that they get a drug through the government for 1,300 for the cost of a 12-week 12, 12 cost treatment. Okay? It's a generic equivalent from Egypt. The original American equivalent, for those of you happy to pay it, you want an original, you can pay 67,000 US dollars. Why do you have this? Because you have people like Mr. Martin Shkreli, for example, who proudly buys and sells, buys uh, patents and sells drugs arbitrarily. He increased the price of the drug he bought the patent for by 6,000%. 6,000%, okay? By 64. Okay? And there was absolutely no rationale. He claimed that it was for research, but when the books were open, there was absolutely no research done by the company. 
So I think we have to be very, very careful with, with a lot of claims which are being made and the, the advantages of having the single purchaser and so on and so forth. And I think one of the other things one might learn from the from the from the from the calculation system, which is part of the national health service, is that you basically are incentivizing doctors to keep their potential patients in good health. Okay, that's the way the calculation system works. So you can actually transform incentives in the health system by structuring the system to uh, well. But you cannot do that by bits and pieces, by trying to get the pub public system to supplement the private system, or vice versa. You know, that, I, I'm afraid, is going to. Now, if people still insist on this, on, on going to private providers, you have Harley Street in London. People can still go to Harley Street. And you might remember that the, the father of uh, generic uh, medicines, uh, Zafrullah Chowdhury, generic Zafrullah Chowdhury, actually left his Harley Street practice to go and support the Bangladesh War of National Liberation and later on became, was elevated and played a very important role in trying to in getting the so-called 200 generic uh, drugs. But that quote is, is virtually irrelevant today. Less than 10% of the drugs are still being used. They have been superseded by other drugs and those other new drugs replacing them, even if they only slight changes, like paracetamol, for example, slight changes are, are, do, are not subjected to this. So developing countries are vulnerable. Poor developing countries are even more vulnerable. And I think we have to think about this also in terms of this. There was a study done by the UNDP which showed that the drugs, the drug prices, the, the, the middle income developing countries are, um, like, like Malaysia, uh, pay on average about three to four percent. Poor developing countries pay about six. Sorry, not not three. No, not. Uh, we pay about on average about three to four times. In Malaysia's case, I think it's closer to three times. In a in a lower middle income country, it's closer to four times or perhaps even more. But in the case of poor, low income countries, they are paying an average of about six times. So it was in response to this that, 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 that people like Wagstaff and his collaborators looked at this very uh, very carefully. But unfortunately, that kind of argument, because Wagstaff was very senior, he, he had a lot of, of influence, but once he, he, he retired, um, that whole tradition is, is lost from the back. And we were very lucky that Firas Rahat was a man who trained in public health at, at Johns Hopkins and Harvard before, before he came to Malaysia. But he was an exception because most people who come are not trained with that kind of sensitivity because, as Professor Williams correctly pointed out, my dear friend Jeff, I didn't know Jeff Hakkot taught you, but Jeff was a very, very close and dear friend. And, you know, I, I, I think it's very important to recognize the special characteristics of health systems and, and and what it means to think about efficiencies in the health system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jomo. Okay, really, we are really short of time. Um, Jeff, uh, Amjad, and Guimeng, uh, two minutes if you have anything to say. The fundamental issue in a market, for a market to work, you have to have a balance between the purchaser, the consumer, and the supplier. If you don't have that, the market cannot work. And in healthcare, the consumer is almost universally uninformed or underinformed. And what's more, is almost always extremely vulnerable because they're unwell. And particularly if they are the parent of a child, they are extremely emotionally vulnerable. And what that means is, in almost all circumstances in healthcare, you do not have a rational well-informed, balanced purchaser. If you don't have that, the prerequisite for a market to work is gone. Because all of the power then is in the supply. And that isn't, that when we talk about the supplier, we talk about a nexus. We're talking about the pharmaceutical industry. We're talking about the hospital providers themselves and the managers. We're talking about the medical practitioners who I don't call 
They don't. These, uh, these medical practitioners have an incentive in any private-based system where they are paid. They have an incentive to treat you whether you need that or not because they get paid. And in the Malaysian system, that incentive is absolutely binding. Yeah? You can, my friend went with a slip disc, which should have been treated by physiotherapy, but was instead prescribed major surgery, 120,000 ringgit. Why? Because the person that he went to was a surgeon. Surgeons don't get paid for physiotherapy. They get paid for surgery. And this type of incentive on the part of the medical practitioners themselves is at the core of the corruption. Because they get paid to slice you open, whether you need it or not. And the insurance companies pay them to do that. Because the insurance companies need you to buy the insurance from them. Right? So when you have that imbalance, you cannot have a market solution in that, in that context. Therefore, you need to have regulation. And in my view, the question of how it's funded and all of this are first order questions. How you fund it, you find out how much it costs, you find out the best way of raising the taxes, right? GST is the worst way of raising the tax. Right? A 3% fee payment tax would pay for all of it, right? By, by contrast. <clears throat> if you know how much it costs, you know how much you can raise. It has to be raised through taxes. Has to be raised through taxes. But if that's a first order question, first order problem. The second issue is who provides it. In Germany, the state pays, the private sector provides. That works for the well, it doesn't matter. But the state is there to regulate the behavioral problems that would otherwise lead to the market exploitation. You always need to have regulation. Uh, in this market because of the problem of the uninformed consumer. The consumer cannot regulate the market by themselves. Someone else has to do that. And it cannot be the medical professionals themselves. It cannot be. Because the MMC is a cesspit of corruption. When you see malpractice with doctors, the MMC are the ones who are regulating the doctors and they will protect themselves. To the extent that they will even argue in the court that the, the High Court has no authority over them. And that means that they themselves, as a profession, are involved very much in that exploitation of the patient. Although that's just changed recently. Yes, it's changed because of the case that we brought. Exactly. We brought that case. Oh, really yes. They argued in the court they were a law unto themselves. And we've just had that all the time to say that no, you're not. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> not much other than to agree with you when we disagree this started at the beginning. I, I like what you said. And this is where I think uh, uh, very important is tax. We need tax or general duty. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. I mean, which tax, I mean, that's open for discussion for sure. But I think that recognition is very, very important that it has to be tax funded. And to me, usually, not necessarily only healthcare, but in general, uh, social policy, when we talk about education, health, uh, there is another important function to it that it creates a common narrative. I mean, not, like now, Canada is much more diverse than Malaysia, right? We all come from different uh, places. I speak uh, of just English not with American accent because I was raised in another country, but something we find all of us. Uh, uh, one thing that all children go to the same schools, and they eat the same breakfast in the school, and that's create the common narrative. And the second thing is healthcare. When you have very diverse uh, population backgrounds, at least you bring social policy, you bring them together. So when you bring tax to fund healthcare, and that's very important, uh, let's not talk about education, that's another thing. It creates that common narrative that the rich and poor and the different races, they receive something that in common, and that's very important for Malaysia. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the tax can be whatever, but at least the recognition that revenue-based uh, financing. Thank you. 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 Th
finally. Okay, um, so I would just like to make two points. I think the first point is that um, providing more comprehensive uh, and how would say you can tell, okay, does not necessarily mean you actually have to spend uh, more money on it. Because if you look at uh, Malaysia health expenditures, quite a lot of it is actually wastage, especially when you look at the private sector. So if you if you have a look at that, there actually been quite a number of research studies comparing. So I think in Malaysia, we often have this perception where uh, the private sectors provide better care. But you know, really, you know, when I talk about care, when we talk about care, I think we should refer to you know, a, a poor care is actually getting the treatment or getting the health services that you need and do not get what you do not need. Whereas you know, a lot of time, what the private providers are selling you is actually you know air conditioned spaces or maybe private space and all. Those are actually not care. Okay, this is an add-on, but that's actually the perception. But if you look across different studies that comparing uh, the quality of care in private sectors versus public sectors, the results has always been consistent. Uh, the care is actually way worse off. So, for example, I'll just take one very simple measure of quality of care, which is antibiotic prescribing for alcohol respiratory tract infection. So, you know, if you get flus and all, it's usually viral infection. You do not need antibiotic. In fact, getting antibiotic means that there's a chance that in the future, when you actually get uh, bacterial infections, the factory is actually resistant to the antibiotic. And, you know, it's actually more costly to treat antibiotic-resistant infections. So, if you look at the percentage in uh, URTI, uh, in URTI getting uh, Antibiotic prescription is about 16 plus percent in the public, public sector. In private sector, it's actually 58 percent. So more than half of the patients going to private sectors actually get antibiotic prescription. So the other thing is actually, I think we often heard, right? So the private uh, health insurance companies often quote this global medical trend survey. So there was quote, right? So if you look at uh, figures of from last year, it's 12 percent inflation, medical inflation is 12 percent, 16 percent. This is very high. Hi, hi. But if you look at uh, the definition of inflation is that for the same basket of goods, the price is increased. But when, when you're looking at actual def using this actual definition, our actual medical inflation rate is only like about 0.5, not never It has never gone up about that. I mean, it's, uh, if you look at the entire health services, but if you break down according to outpatients and inpatients, it's about that range, but only that during COVID time, it was a bit higher because uh, you know getting care is more difficult. Uh, that's why it's been more money. Mm -hmm. In Malaysia. So if you look at Dawson figure, if you trust their methodology, so it's about 1.8% uh, for outpatient, 1.2% for inpatient service. So that's the inflation. But why do we hear this 12% and 16%? In fact, I can tell you that I had a certain point, uh, had access to data of private companies. I've run some analysis whether they can shape, you know, 12% or 16% inflation. I can tell you no. In, in fact, if you look at the cost, right, so for example, right, uh, I take health screening, for example. The same house screen, if let's say the package does not change, something that cost you 80 ringgit last year will probably cost you 60 ringgit only this year. But they will never, never sell you the same package. In fact, they will sell you something that actually has more tax. They will sell you something that's 60 ringgit, uh, 80 ringgit last year. This year, they're going to sell you something that's 100 ringgit, but actually has more tax included. So that is actually a lot of our increase in the so-called medical inflation, so as reported in global medical, so medical trends of the report. It's actually from increase in consumption, not actually increase. It is, it's not true inflation. And if you look at the methodology, uh, they basically just run a survey of uh, insurance companies and say, oh, what's the inflation cost? The inflation like in, you know, for your uh, uh, insured, then they just say, oh, it's about 12%, 16 to get average. That's why how they report the numbers. And on that basis, they have been increasing premium every year. So, oh, you see, that global. Uh, the medical trends are really reported. So reported that we have no choice, we are going to increase. And then doctor sees the, the private doctor sees the space to actually you know, prescribe more uh, services that's actually unnecessary. So providing better care does not necessarily entail higher cost actually. I know that is quite a lot of mechanisms we can put in, like what the Prof. Yama was mentioning, like that one way is uh, competition, people performance, there have been a lot of number of experiments going on in different countries on so how you can actually improve. So I just quote one example from Korea that I see just now, right? So they were actually targeting antibiotic prescribing because they have single purchases, single payer system. So what they were doing is that you will not get paid for antibiotic prescribing prescription that's actually not necessary. So just doing, by doing that, alone, they manage to actually save cost of 31 billion US dollars. Yeah. So actually, if you know, if I would actually think that a single purchases, single payer system would actually be very powerful. 
not only because you can negotiate prices, okay, since you have the volume, the economic skill, the other thing is actually you actually can actually decide not to pay. So not like current private insurance, right? Since I can just increase premium, why not I just basically approve whatever that I can approve? So if that happens, okay, that's one. Uh, second, I think you know we don't have to again. I will reiterate that I do not believe it's a zero zero sum game. You can actually have. Uh, I think most importantly, to have a single purchase or single payer system, uh, where the uh, fundings come from actually depends on you know individual con countries context. So I think in our context, right, as I've shown, for most of our former workers, we are not talking even about the informal workers, people who are, who are outside labour force. We are talking about former workers who are employed. Their wage is already too low for you to actually reduce their tech pay further. So some, that's something that will not be favourable in the, in the short term. Um, so how do we then increase the uh, revenues coming from the, the revenues that the general taxes, right? So one, of course, is like what the just suggested. The other thing is we can actually emulate what Taiwan or uh, Korea, Korea has done and uh, many other countries done is to earmark what is so, the so-called sin taxes for health workers. So alcohol taxes, tobacco taxes, you know, these are the taxes actually, uh, or, or even in Malaysia, right, sugar is actually a huge issue. That's the reason why we have really high prevalence of uh, diabetes and heart diseases. So sugar taxes, you know, if you, if you see the number of sugars in a single cane or a single bottle, it's, it's actually very surprising how much you're taking every day. So these are the things that you can do in, in the meantime, but in, in future, so let's say you don't know, even income, income has improved, you know, just like how the other OCD countries, right, when they can improve, they can tax more and what. So for me, whether you have a system where you contribute to a general tax and then they pay directly to the single PJ system, or you actually contribute directly, you know, might not necessarily be a social health insurance because usually social health insurance is limited to those who can contribute, but basically it can be going directly into the fund, meaning you're actually paying extra taxes that is dedicated for health, if let's say the contribution go directly into the fund, but or otherwise we can actually you know, be paying through the taxes and then the tax will actually allocate certain percentage. The risk for that is that if let's say a change in political, you know, the leadership and all, they decided, okay, now I'm not going to spend so much on health. So even with the increase in taxes, maybe it's going into other purposes in the health. But with this fund, the single fund, it, it means you are actually contributing, it's a, in, in another way, an increase in tax, but the tax actually go directly into this fund. So that's how I view this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as well, one minute, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, every time I, I, I glance at my colleague from EPF, I'm reminded at the fact that the majority of contributors to EPF right now have less than 10,000 ringgit in their accounts and have drained pretty much their savings for Sumanga uh, Haritua, right? Uh, and this is something that we have to uh, remind ourselves because uh, of sometimes we romanticize the fact that if we have some sort of savings account that people will be reminded that I shouldn't spend or I should take care of myself. No, that's not the case. And EPF experience is, is an example of that. I just wanted to mention a few things uh, very briefly. First of all, any kind of tax dependent initiative has to be cognizant of the fact that the majority of Malaysians who are earning an income in this country are earning below uh, level, uh, you know, uh, wages. You know, they should be paid a lot more. Any kind of reference to G uh, Europe where there's higher taxes and in terms of, of how much you, you you cannot just take that and, and put it in Malaysia because when 80% of households qualify for the Sumbangan Tunai Rahma, you know you have a problem. That means you're only dependent on like 20%. Uh, the other one is, is that in terms of the uh, the syntax, you know, syntax, one of the problems that we have with, and I think political will was mentioned earlier, is that there is a reluctance from any government, not just this government, but previous governments also that we've worked on, on earmarking. They refuse to earmark uh, uh, tax that should be used for health, like sin taxes, alcohol and tobacco both contribute 5.4 billion ringgit, you know, in terms of excess. By right, this should go straight to health. You don't have to think about it. You do something like Thailand, for example, where that model exists, and you have a board that is used to monitor the spending of that money. But Malaysia, we put it all in a consolidated fund and we refuse to earmark. Same thing with the SSB tax. The sugar tax, which was introduced, earmarked for healthy breakfast programs for school. The previous prime minister, uh, actually a few prime ministers ago, uh, 
removed it from that earmark and put it back to the consolidated fund. And today we're back to square one again, where we're collecting SSB tax, but it's not being used for the purpose that's intended. So the problem here is really concerning any initiative we put is the political will and to make use of money for the benefit of health. And I can tell you, even with this government, health is low on the priority, despite it being the second largest budget in the federal government. Thank you, sir. A word was stuck in my mouth, I, I need to clarify it. I totally agree with you, uh, 10 seconds, huh? Sorry. I, I totally agree with you, Mr. Braswell, that you cannot compare. I never said tax on income, just to be clear, because the very reason, and social health insurance is tax on income, so you put, you're actually against what you said, because at the end of the day, it's limited, so that's why you're not. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of the session. Um, I, I really need to thank everybody for being patient and listening. Um, personally, I, I learned a lot. Uh, it's not an area that I know much of. And that's why you know, I, I, I really was absorbing quite a lot of information. Uh, I'm not going to try and make any summary, but what we, what we did cover, sources and types of uh, funds that can be used to, you know, to fund a, a public health system. Um, it, there's no zero-sum game. I think it's very important. Probably in the Malaysian context, it's going to be mixed. Yeah. Um, but certainly, tax would have to play a big role uh, for the simple reason that we are talking about a public health system. And I think in Malaysia, the way it goes, the public health system is generally focused on people who maybe would not go to a, or cannot afford to go to a private system. Um, and therefore, the sources of funds could come from reallocating some of the ridiculous things that have been subsidized today. Um, and so that would be a major source that could be used. Uh, and I agree fully, it should go into targeted uh, areas, like if it's coming from this source, it should go to health or something like that. Uh, and then we talked about two important um, maybe additional areas, the governance structures, um, legal frameworks, etc., is some area that can also be enhanced to make sure that we have a health system that works, and of course the management of, of health system. I think these are two areas that don't usually maybe get enough uh, focus when we have programs like this. And finally, learning from other countries, we heard Korea, Taiwan, Canada, um, maybe a few other countries. We can learn maybe from many other countries that could be examples for it. So with that, uh, once again, thank you all very much. And I now, uh, I just need to apologize also to Juan Azizi. I, I took over your job. <laughs> Jomo mentioned Bidan Kampung. I became Bidan Kampung. So, so, so uh, I hand it back to Yasa. Thank you very much. All right. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, we will now simply just bring this um, roundtable discussion, a series of roundtable discussions to an end with the way we began, with whom we began. Basically, I would like to invite Prof. Azmi. Oh, I thought it was... Okay. All right. So, yeah, Prof. Garu, it seems it's you who's going to end. <laughs> So you can, I guess, take the podium. Okay. So again, so it's already uh, 5.20. Uh, okay, I would like to thank everyone who have been here for, uh, the whole, for the whole day. Uh, even though it's only after 5, we still have people uh, over here. We have had... Um, Two different discussions. Uh, the one in the morning is about uh, education, uh, and now uh, the one in the afternoon is uh, on, uh, on, uh, on on public health financing. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to. Okay, so we have the videos and everything. Uh, this is uh, a part of the uh, program that we have uh, from the ICIF that we have in. Uh, that we have in February, so hopefully we'll be able to have more uh, of this uh, post uh, post uh, conf post ICIEF uh, conference. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if we have the funding from 
Okay, so, so hopefully we will be able to, to discuss further because we have the uh, we have the fund from uh, uh, from the government. No. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, dis discuss more and, and come up with uh, much more um, uh, interesting uh, discussions that we will be able to have the the, the countries. Okay, with that, uh, thank you uh, again uh, and see you later. <laughs> And I'll have to uh, have a program for them on on Thursday. <laughs> ah, they want that now. Fiscal thing. Ah, salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alright, and um, thank you, Prof. Daru, for um, your closing comments. And so I'd like to officially bring this uh, series of roundtables. Uh, to a close, and we hope that you know the takeaways from this will materialize into some kind of action through further discussions, uh, hopefully. Um, so thank you very much for your patience and your time. Um, what we'll do is we'll break for some more refreshments, and so I would like to invite our guest speakers and VIP members to follow our committee member. We have a separate area for um, refreshments for them. So, yeah. And the rest of us will wait for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, good end. Do, 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 do.